Let's get right into it. Today's guest is Kyle Boosted Boys. Uh, he doesn't really need much introduction, guys. Uh, he's built Hondas and now <laughs> two J's. Joining the induction performance team over here, I'm dude. I'm excited, man. I'm pumped to have you on the team. I was kind of the only one that was uh, really racing on the team, so it's nice to uh, <laughs> it's nice to add another face. Yeah, went down there. Victor hooked me up and going to put a 2J in a Civic and see what happens. <laughs> Six cylinder in a Honda Civic. That's a tough car because it puts you in some weird classes. We already talked about that a little bit. Yeah, the biggest issue with it is it doesn't have the factory front suspension. Mm -hmm. We could do a lot more with it, but that's a big, big rule for most classes. So our main intent with it is just to build it for the drag and drives, have fun with it. Yeah. It's really like a content car, not necessarily a full blown dedicated drag event race car, but we're going to hopefully squeeze it into some classes here and there. And just did you? With it. We were talking one time about the car. Did you look into like changing the front suspension to maybe be class legal? Because you can make factory s front suspension if it's just like Mustang front suspension or 240SX front suspension, and you can kind of get away with it like that. Yeah, we really haven't put <laughs> too much uh, <laughs> thought into that just yet. I think our plan is really just to get it done, and then we'll see how how we can you know maybe get around those rules or what mm -hmm. we need to change on the car after the chassis and uh engine combo proves that it's you know what we want it to do yeah. before we start you know really diving into all that stuff yeah because you can make i mean you'll probably make 1500 horsepower on that i saw you said 200 miles an hour i'm like man that's going to be a stretch with a cast block even I mean, at that weight I, I think it can do it though 200 miles an hour is going to be I mean, tough. My, my ricer math i've seen like you know, K-Series almost do it, and I figured with a 2J, the extra yeah. couple cylinders and the torque in that light of a chassis, it should be should be possible. I don't know, Victor said that we could do it. Yeah, I, I know it'll ET really good. I was just wondering about mile an hour, especially with turbo, obviously. But yeah. if you if you stay away from Pro Mod turbo on a 2J, they last really long. Once you start looking at Pro Mod turbos, the <laughs> longevity I've noticed depletes just quickly declines from there it's like a shelf like they just like drop off <laughs> but i don't know what you guys are looking at yeah i mean we'll see what it turns into so i've been on the phone with m&m we're gonna do a th400 in it dang that's and, gonna be uh, sick yeah just send it so do like probably avoid a lockup i would imagine yeah no lockup yeah lockup on small motors is hard on things and hard on the wallet yep all that stuff so it's a good way to leave your drive over your crank as they say <laughs> yeah i mean i'm gonna i'm new to all the auto stuff so it's really easy you just like dee, dee, dee. and you probably won't even do that It'll yeah we're, air. Gonna, we're probably gonna put it on an air shifter and yeah consistent let go. set it to do what you want it to do and it does it every time i drove um mcflurry the other day and i was all thrown off i was like what the hell I'm pulling all the levers i was just like <laughs> i felt like such an idiot but they don't they don't have a rev limiter in it. So, like, I just start to feel it dying off. It never, like, reached a limit of RPM. I was like, just, is it just not going to, like, stop revving? It's it's kind of weird how those, uh, what was that transmission called, Lenko? Yeah. It's just weird watching it because it almost, it sounds like a CVT transmission or something where it doesn't mm -hmm. have that, you don't hear the difference in ratios that much. It's almost It's almost... When I watch it, it almost looks like the levers aren't even doing anything when you hear the car because it's just like... Rah. It doesn't feel like they are. Yeah, you don't feel like that ratio change, but obviously yeah. it works. It left pretty hard. It was a pretty slow pass. I only went like 9.0. I was like, wow, this is like the slowest this car has been. <laughs> and I didn't do anything wrong besides I hung the gears out too long. But you would assume like I would have, you know, at least like if you drive like a... If I was driving like a Honda, I would have heard the limiter and I would have like known to grab the next gear. Mm -hmm. This thing, like, there was no indication to shift. <laughs> it was just, like, all... Once you start to feel it fall off, you gotta yeah. pull the next lever. And then Adam went, like, 880 in it or something, I think. So yeah, I saw that. LZ drove it after. But that was that's a weird car to drive. But the your Civic will probably be very similar weight to that thing, so I can't imagine it goes anything anything slower than, like, a 111 60-foot, which will just be the best. That would... That would be great. So 60 foots are the best part of drag racing. I'm fully convinced. <laughs> and I've never had a car that has, has 60 footed past. I mean, the MR2's best has been a 129. 
and that's slow compared to most yeah you know true drag setup cars so i'm excited to hopefully get it in the at least like the teens and really feel what you know coming out of the whole hard is like mm -hmm. and just yeah, hopefully it. Yeah, that stays project would be really cool. Did you talk to Precision at tur about turbos yet? Uh, no, we haven't gone that far yet. I'm excited because their next gen stuff is just started to roll out, and like their new next gen 88, I think, just came out, and that thing looks sick. Oh, yeah. Like the next gen, I had a buddy that switched from twin 76 next gens to twin 70 or from the regular to the next gen 76s and they picked up 300 horsepower just doing that. Yeah, it's crazy every just time they come out turbos. with their their new generation of the same size they're just like yeah, there's a couple extra hundred more. So extra horsepower. It's tough for the rules because it becomes like a money game at that point where like for the front wheel drive stuff, then you're just like the guy that has to buy the new turbo because the size doesn't really matter anymore when people are like, "Oh, it gets the same size, but the next gen is that much better." Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to start kind of small with the first turbo, like air quotes small, but just get the car tested and dialed in before we really start throwing serious power at it. I mean, with my 86, I've been, you know, 760s at 3,200 pounds. Yeah, we're hoping to be in like the 2,400 yeah. or possibly less So that's range. just the weight alone with the same setup with a better transmission i mean we've had this conversation off air but like that's just that alone in my opinion is going to be such a huge jump yeah I mean, they got six second supras with the same combo and mm -hmm. they're all three thousand plus pounds and i mean we can keep talking about it, but the only way we're going to know is until we get it going so we can break out the uh the ricer math or the bench I've bench been, racing all day i've had many hours of ricer math going into this thing mm -hmm. and it yeah. just says that it should be fast that's what the ricer math comes out to it won't be slow it would be cool to like do a little bit of like no prep racing or something with it too because it doesn't fit in well but you can race like no time or no prep or like some street yeah, stuff with i it. feel like any class that's limited to the tire size and anything else goes that's mm -hmm. probably where we're going to be able to squeeze it in and yeah i was talking to my friend hayden because he's doing all that no prep stuff yeah he uh, has been driving out to Texas doing it. He's been messaging me all the time. He's like, when are you going to get that Civic ready so we can take it to some no prep events? So that's a possibility. To get his car down here. I know. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, we need to get Hayden out here again. Yeah, he should just move down to Florida at this point. I know, but I've, I've tried to get him out here, but I think he's really content. He's talked about possibly going to Texas. I think if he were to leave Colorado, he'd probably go to Texas. Yeah, the problem is like, you know, you kind of have to chase the track a little bit, too, like, with what we do. Like, if Bradenton left, yeah. like, if BMP closed, like, I would move, probably, because I kind of have to follow the track. Yeah, how far away is OSW from here? It's, like, three hours, and but... Is that the closest drag strip mm -hmm. other than Bradenton? But I think they're in a little bit of danger as well. I don't think that they're free and clear. I think neighborhoods are pressing in on them. Really? Yeah, so, I mean, you just lost your home track where you grew up so it's like yeah i mean but they got until the end of the year so what have you heard what they're planning to do like i know they're probably getting a lump sum of money are they going to build something i mean i heard they got a lot for that property and it sounds like they are looking to build either way out east in colorado or even like northeast and there was actually some land for sale by our shop and when i was down there brent said that they actually mm. came and looked at that area but it was still a little too like close to the highway, close to I-25 in development and just not ideal. So they're going to have to probably go way out east. But from what it sounds like, they want to rebuild something as soon as they can, like hopefully within the next couple of years. Yeah. Because, yeah, if Bradenton goes down then, or uh, Bandemir, I mean, um, there's like nowhere for any drag racing to go down in Colorado except for like Pueblo. And that's more of a kind of family-owned small track mm -hmm. and it can't sustain any big events or anything like that and the town of pueblo is like super sketchy yeah and it's also <laughs> no one likes going there and it's like a three-hour drive for most people yeah it's it, so far south is it that far for you guys too to get to pueblo it's like three hours from our shop in colorado yeah that's a trip it's tough too because building anything you know most of the year you're closed so like you almost have to build something that you can somehow be multi-purpose like, i don't know what you could do 
both there. Maybe you can do some like snow racing of some sort on the drag strip. Build a snowmobile that you can take the put a slick on it for the summer and have you put seen a track some of those snowmobiles? Yeah, they're nuts. I saw the the TRC videos of them. Yeah, they go like they go like fives in the eighth. Yeah, <laughs> they're going like two hundred out the back. Like that's wild. That's like drag car numbers on a snowmobile. It's yeah, pretty nuts. We don't really have those in Florida though. It's funny because people look for those engines every now and then for like swabs, and mm -hmm. you just can't get them down here. Yeah, right. When I was in uh, Colorado recently, they had an ATV class in between us, and they also had snowmobiles racing there. So mm -hmm. there's these guys lining up in with four wheelers, and then you'd see a couple snowmobiles just slammed to the ground, mobbing through the pits, and it's just it's pretty crazy to see. And I think on the asphalt, <laughs> yeah, on the asphalt, and they have like little wheels on their front skis, yeah. and they just cruise them up into the pits and they're running like freaking mid 11s low 10s all over the place but it's just you don't see that anywhere else really other than the states that yeah you know, get snow all the time and it has to be like specific states too like colorado and like i feel like michigan is big on it but like then there's some states that are snow but not as much like kentucky and stuff is like a little bit less so it's like weird it's a very niche of a niche yeah and then you guys get all the all-wheel drive stuff up there too which I feel like the all-wheel drive Hondas really blew up from Colorado because that's where all the all-wheel drive stuff was. Yeah, all my poor wagons, man. Getting all chopped up for their all-wheel drive, drive. You ruined thing. the market on those, dude. It wasn't just me. It was all the freaking Honda boys wanting to go all-wheel drive. Somebody but. made a bunch of videos about them, and I think that's what ruined the market. You know, some YouTubers making these videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I got my wagon, the one I drove out here today, for $800 in a YMCA parking lot. Mm -hmm. It's an RT four-wheel drive Civic wagon. Today, if I just took the drive shaft, the viscous coupler, rear diff, and axles out of it, I could probably get thirty-five hundred for it all. And that's disgusting. just for that. And I at one point had three of them, mm -hmm. all under a thousand dollars. They were sitting in my parents' driveway, taking up all their space. They thought they were pieces of crap, <laughs> but they were just everywhere in Colorado. That was yeah. probably one of the most popular states to have a four-wheel drive Civic wagon, and. Uh, now they're just becoming so rare because the second one becomes available, not only are they expensive now, but when they're bought, they just strip the all-wheel drive stuff off them and that gets turned into all-wheel drive Civic race cars and then they just throw the shell away and that's that. Yeah, that's kind of how it goes. And then people end up needing to use more shells for Hondas because like every Honda guy has multiple shells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they always have like all the spare parts all the shells. I feel like as a Honda owner, racer, you have to hoard parts pretty aggressively. You're, yeah, you, you need to start hanging on to stuff. It wasn't as bad, you know, even just like five years ago, but stuff's getting harder to find. There is a YouTuber effect, I feel like, with a lot of cars. Like with rotary stuff and like other kind of like 2Js. 2Js probably don't have a YouTuber effect, but like a lot of cars have like a U, an automotive YouTuber effect where they blow up. Because of that, I think, like, the K cars yeah. got hit by a YouTuber explosion. GTRs, I think a lot of YouTubers have upped the price on those, like R32s and I'd, 33s. I'd say we made more of an impact on the MR2 world. Oh, yeah. The MR2s are going crazy now, too. Well, you have, like, half of the NSXs as well <laughs> that came to the U.S. <laughs> yeah, you got a couple of them. <laughs> I mean, how many even came to the U.S.? Do you? I, I believe it was around 3,300. That's pretty low. And there's one guy that has one chopped in half, so there's one gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many more have been wrecked throughout the... That might have been the total... I'm pretty sure, yeah, total amount. See, that's why you need someone here to pull it up. Yeah. Just pull up how many NSXs came. But, yeah, I believe it's somewhere around 3,000, so there's not many. Yeah, it's pretty low production number, especially to have three. Right? You have three at this point? Yeah, like 0.01%. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's pretty good numbers. I mean, well, that's if that's how many actually came, then who knows mm -hmm. how many are actually left from accidents or whatever it may yeah. be. Yeah, there's probably some imported ones, but nobody wants those. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I, always, I always say that and people get mad. That's why I don't want to own a GTR. I don't want to sit on the wrong side of my car. I think they're cool, but yeah, I wouldn't want to <laughs> drive a right-hand drive car. I've driven a couple and like it's cool, but... It's just not as practical out here. Plus, no. you can't go to McDonald's. You have to, like, go in backwards. Seems like the fun would wear off quickly for me to just sit on the wrong side of the car all the time. And I don't like the shifting very much. We did it in Australia a little bit, which was, it was weird to get used to. 
trying to drive on the opposite side of the road that completely. Would, yeah, I don't think I'd trust myself. I'd catch myself like going right into oncoming traffic, I think. It threw me off a little bit. My brother came back from like a three-month long trip to like I don't know, Malaysia or something, and he came back and he almost killed us all doing that. <laughs> my whole family, I was like, oh, God. Yeah. I, I wouldn't take my chances. Especially if you're on like in like a motorcycle or something on the wrong side of the road when you're over there because then it'll really throw you yeah, off. Yeah, because then you're not like in the wrong seat or anything. You're just... Yeah. You have to remember <laughs> to stay on the right side of the road or you're done. Yeah, that would make it really tough. Australia was not super bad to get used to because I didn't drive all that much. Mostly let Garrett drive because he, he, gets, he gets the more excitement from that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather just not have any responsibility if I don't have yeah, he to. Likes, <laughs> he likes to drive whatever he can, so he likes exactly. the challenge. <laughs> Even if it's just a minivan and you're dropping it into gear from neutral, a wide open throttle because it's a rental car. Yeah, yeah. It's a given. <laughs> yeah. So um, your Florida man career has fully blossomed into the boats. Mm-hmm. 2K vehicles on the water. And surprisingly, they're still floating. Yeah. Have you used them very much? I feel like it's so tough to find the time for different, at, like, completely different things like that. The airboat, we have only taken out once. It still needs some work. The jet boat, we've used, I'd say, a fair mm-hmm. amount of times. Like, we've we've gotten some good use out of it, and we were hoping to actually, we were going to go out with Garrett to Idaho, but it just didn't line up, and we've been making a whole bunch of plans for this summer to take it out as well. So I'm excited to get the jet boat out and going. And, yeah, we've used it quite a bit, honestly. Yeah, the jet boat seems like a very practical vehicle yeah. compared to the airboat. Yeah, the airboat's sketchy. <laughs> Airboats are sketchy because they, they, like, take off sometimes. Yeah, I've seen the videos of them going, like, 80, like 80 mm-hmm. mile an hour. They catch catch air and just backflip. It's The old owner yet. of BMP was telling me they used to do airboat racing out there, and he stopped it because one – at like 70 miles an hour, just like, because yeah. when it rains, the field gets so wet, you could just airboat race. <laughs> yeah, because that guy died, didn't he? I don't know if he did. I, I heard I would imagine he shut it down. I would imagine a 70 mile an hour into the air. But we all know what we sign up for in these things, so kind of is sad, of course, but it is what it is. We all sign up for this stupid activity of going fast in sketchy vehicles. Yeah. I've gone faster than I probably should. And See all the news about the submarine? Yeah, dude. That's a sketchy vehicle. <laughs> Did you watch, like, <sighs> I was watching, like, and then I got this from Camping World. The yeah. I was in there, I was like, Camping World? I'd be out. The second he said he got parts from Camping World so, and an be Xbox fair, controller. Like, I wouldn't get into it because I know that guy's just like how we are. Like, we're like, eh, it'll be fine. We... We can cheap out on this stuff. It'll get us by because, like, that's what we kind of do in cars, mm-hmm. but we can get away with it. You know, you try to do that in something like that. It's it's so sad it's for those good. people that yeah. lost their lives. But, like, man, that guy built a sketchy thing. Like, he was – it was – it's, like, an eerie video to watch him joking about the terrible build quality because, you know, like, it's fine to joke about our terrible build quality. But then mm-hmm. when that's the cause of all of this – is an eerie thing to look back on. Like, he's like, ha, 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 we control it with this remote, and it's, I built it ignoring regulations, and it's, like, very funny in the moment. But then when, <laughs> you know, disaster strikes, everyone's like, ooh. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe somebody shouldn't have done that. Yeah, and once it was on the bottom, they were like, yeah, we can't get it back. It's, yeah, they're, it's two miles underwater. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people kind of realized right away that it was a lost cause. Everyone was obviously hopeful, but... They spent $10 million of taxpayer dollars already. Yeah, just that's nuts. looking for it just to identify where it was. I don't know. That was crazy. I, it, just, it sucks that those incidents are what make the regulations get tighter. It's always something has to go bad for mm-hmm. stuff to go good. So, so is a K-series submarine not on your... <laughs> no, K-series submarine. <laughs> unless one of the boats decides to spring a big leak, we do not plan on... Make if it's, like, not so. that deep, it's fine. Like, if it doesn't have to, like, really be pressurized, you know? If it's, like, where you can swim out if you had to. Yeah, or, like, I could put some scuba gear on or something. Yeah, like, 50 feet down or something where it's, like, you can still yeah. see light. We're not 
we're not putting it in an ocean though. I think once you can't see light anymore, the the need to go any deeper really starts to disappear. Once I can't see anything that I'm diving into, I'm good. Well, they I'm say out. sunlight reaches three thousand feet, so that's yeah. already way beyond where I'd be comfortable. They were like twelve thousand, so I don't even know what they were planning to see. Maybe they what's right in front of your lights, I guess. Yeah, I mean they got their headlights to see it, so. Yeah, that situation sucked. The whole world was watching that, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one, man. Um, your Tesla, too. <laughs> that, <laughs> I can't believe that you you got your NHRA license in that thing. and I don't know if anyone's ever done that. Cause... It just shows how terrible their licensing system is. Be- or how great it is. I mean, I was loving it. <laughs> <laughs> it was great it for you. It easy for me. But it shows how much they really care. Like, it, they don't truly care that you can handle driving a real car because you were yeah. able to get licensed in something that was worlds apart from your MR2. Yeah, well, hopefully they don't. See, well, that's the thing is they don't ask for the type of vehicle it is. Yeah, they don't care. They just want to see the time slips. But that's going to be, that would be a hard stipulation because, say, they do make it unfair for a Tesla. Like, if you have the more proper well-built your race car is, the easier it's going to be to drive Mm. naturally. So that would make it, if they start putting in, oh, well, your car has to be this hard to drive, and you have to at least do these steps, you know, it's going to start opening up a can of worms. It's just crazy because, like, a completely stock car going down the track, and suddenly you're okay to go, you know, what, 750s or something? Yeah, I think that's what I started (laughs) Or is a 750 and slower. Yeah, it just doesn't really make much sense. I've always said this, just a money grab, but I've always openly said that, so I don't really mind. That's whatever. I, I try got, to avoid the money grabs. I got my license, and so now tech won't be as annoying when it does come up. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really only got it to go on, like, the drag and drive stuff, and there's only a few. I mean, I've made it this far without it, yeah. so I think what's mo- more important is the, the car meets its safety features and all of that, because... Mm-hmm end of the day if you mess up like mistakes can happen regardless if you're a pro what's important is that the car is safe yeah and i think uh, that's like that's a thing too is almost like you have to get certified for the car maybe like so you can maybe like prove you can get out there's some people that i've seen get into their car that i don't know if they could get out quickly and that's kind of part of it i've had to get out of a car fairly quickly and that's something that's nice to know when your atf caught on fire yeah my trans fluid was burning yeah, that's not fun. But yeah, like that's kind of important to be able to get out of your car quickly. Yeah, it is. And but every situation is different. The car could roll. It could not. You could be injured. It's it's almost like how you license for like aircraft where like you have your turbo prop and then you got your, you know, your helicopter and your airplane like you get <laughs> you got your EV license yeah. <laughs> and then you can get like your gasoline license. And then, yeah, like, I'm your sure. top fuel. That would make more sense. I mean, they kind of have a... They have... Just ET brackets. A system in play for that. But obviously, it's not as big of a deal as mm-hmm. flying a airplane over, <laughs> no. you know, cities and stuff. Not at all. But, you know, aircraft is weird. If you just claim it's experimental, you're pretty much in the clear. If you claim you have an experimental aircraft, FAA doesn't bother you. It's like a a really weird system. You'd almost think they'd be, that's exactly what they'd have their eyes on. I know. Experimental people. I want to get like license plates made that say experimental, like that you could just put on your car, (laughs) just like a a plate. (laughs) And then, then you're good. And you're good. Nobody will say anything. If you can claim experimental. It's an experiment, man. It's fine. It's not just an unregistered vehicle. If it breaks, it's it's experimental. That's why I have the sticker on there. Exactly. It's hard. It's a pain in the ass to have all these registered cars. Yeah, I'm going through uh, getting a title for our boat right now. And if it's a homemade vessel, it doesn't need any of the numbers. It just, mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, whatever. Trailers are pretty much the same. Yeah. Like if you have just, like a home-built trailer. Yeah, I think it just fly apart. Dude, uh, the airboat trailer, mm-hmm. dude, that thing is 100% homemade and it, is very sketchy. I do not trust it down the highway. Yeah. Yeah, with the boat, like, it's just doesn't even matter. You just make it yourself. You could take, like, a bathtub and put a little motor yeah, on it. And you can register it. <laughs> I wonder they once you get know. to, like, a certain weight and, like, amount of people. I think it's the length. Once it's, like, 
over 16 feet long. Mm. Then you have to bring it in and get it inspected, and then it becomes more serious if it's a bigger vessel. Yeah. That's but little funny. homemade stuff, they're like, whatever. I've I've seen people make, like, those little sandbox boats. Have you ever seen those? Like, those, Mm-mm. there's, like, the sandboxes that were, like, shaped like a boat, and they looked like a boat, and people just put motors on them. Uh, and they're, like, smaller than this table. Almost like a little tykes car, but, like, a boat. Exactly, and they actually float. I was thinking of, like, the turtle sandboxes when you said that. I was like, how would you make that a boat? You could probably do it with that, too, but they had, like, little tykes boats that people okay. actually, like, go down the river in with, like, a little electric, <laughs> a little electric That's deal. That's funny. So that is kind of an interesting one because we've talked about how you want to do more fun builds instead of, like, the serious drag car builds, and now you have two serious drag car builds going yeah, on. Yeah, I think the, uh, the Civic with the 2J and the NSX that we're getting ready to do, those will be my two final, like, those are going to be the most serious drag builds I do for a very long time. Yeah. And then I just have some other, like, more fun ideas, like we're getting ready to do some stuff to the plaid, and that's going to be more of, like, on the fun side. Yeah, it's it's a tough balance with YouTube because, like, you want to do the stuff that does the best, but then you also just want to do stuff that you want to do. And sometimes those don't overlap. They often don't. Yeah. So you kind of have to, like, pick your poison in a way. Yeah, I saw it as kind of, I think, at least I see it as, like, you do you do have a couple serious builds on your channels because those kind of solidify the respect people can have for you. Like, oh, yeah, so you look, they do have some serious cars, but then when you're goofing around, cutting corners, just having fun on, a, like, a piece of crap car, they know that, you know, you're serious behind everything you do. and that Because if all you do is have fun... You know, I feel like you kind of, you might not get the respect you might think you deserve. Like when we first started, yeah. people didn't think we know what we're doing. We still always don't know what we're doing. But, you know, once you, you start building a, a respectable car, then they're like, oh, those guys know what they're doing. Yeah. Like then you then it gives you the leverage to go mess around and people won't like judge you for it because they know that you're just, it's a distinction. Oh, they know this is a crappy car that you're having fun with compared to when you're taking it serious with a race car. So I think it's good to have the good, the serious race cars with a balance of just fun beaters. It's tough too, because like right now, everybody's so used to like six second, seven second. I know and the bar is cars set so high. The bar is really high and building one of those is a very serious operation. Like it's not just like, oh, you know, whatever. Like this was fun. Like, put it together last yeah. night. <laughs> and then like you can build, you know, a fun thing that's like reckless and dangerous and gonna fall apart but it's not as serious because no one's going 200 miles an hour in it so you kind of have like you because you you do have to also think like you are kind of like a role model to people so showing like some sketchy dangerous stuff in a drag car that's going 200 miles an hour is like a it's a scary thing almost too and then like you have like some responsibility I don't know how much you think maybe you have like I feel like I have some to like not be the most reckless person and at least like show a little bit of like safety and like I take care and like make like you take it a little seriously you know what I mean yeah it's definitely more important even for us now like our audience almost makes me more safe because they'll notice one thing you do wrong and they'll Mm -hmm. they'll drill you for it they'll be like oh you didn't have your gloves on that pass or like do this do that make sure you shut your visor yeah we don't want to see you get hurt all this so it's like they almost it's like a community thing helping like they're all showing you what to do to be safe if you are missing something but yeah it's definitely good to try to be the role model it's something i'm not the best at but as we have gotten faster and faster you know we've been paying more and more attention to all that as well yeah i, I kind of get on a lot of my friends about the safety aspect of things i'm like fire suppression put a belly pan on it put your visor down i'm always kind of like preaching that to people just because I mean, yeah because you don't think about it until you need it and then the i mean the one day that something could go wrong yeah that could be it i don't mind sounding like a karen when i do it to people which is helps you know i'll, I'll preach to everyone yeah <laughs> i i get on my friends cars all the time I'm like you don't have a locking dipstick what the hell are you doing like things like that that Sometimes I see them caught on fire. Sometimes I see people that do things and I'm like, I hate to preach too much, but then there is some things that like, yeah, like we need to, we need to be better about this stuff as a whole because any, 
any bad publicity kind of does affect us all as a whole. Yeah. Which hey, is at least we're not thing. doing takeover mates. So no, I'm not doing <laughs> any of those. Mostly because no one's invited me. I mean, if anybody wants to invite me, I'm in. I'm down to watch, but that's about it. And I'm staying like four people back in the crowd. Yeah. And that's still like in the danger zone. And we're not too far from like. I don't know where most of them go on. I feel like it's like Atlanta and L.A. Uh, they definitely had a couple right by us. In Tampa. In Tampa. Brandon Tampa area. area. Yeah. So we, on my way to the gym, there's a big intersection. I went one morning, normal. Next day, the blackest circles I have ever seen out there. There was definitely one there mm -hmm. that I didn't witness. And then one time when me and Wyatt were home, I believe we were, or we were coming home from like a bowling night or something, it was probably 11.30, almost midnight, and all these cars are backed up, and they're doing one right in front of us, like live. And then we see the cops rolling like five minutes later, and they all scatter. They were going crazy, and it was like a movie scene. They all scatter, and yeah. there's still rubber on the intersection just smoking as we drive through it. And I was like, damn, that's, that's serious. Dude, they take it pretty seriously. Some of those videos are wild. I've seen people like light themselves on fire I, just full-blown light themselves on fire. I mean, as I, as much as I hate to say it, I do enjoy seeing people get flung sometimes. It's kind of like it's kind of like that you get what you kind of have it coming to you. You're you just really out do. in the middle trying to film it, be cool, lighting stuff on fire. And if, mm -hmm. you know, you eat a quarter panel, it's kind of on you at that point. Yeah, like if somebody like hits down a telephone pole or something with their car, like some yeah. stupid thing like that and total their car, like 100% deserve it. If you still have payments on that thing too, if you just got it, that's hilarious because yeah, <laughs> you're going to be paying off a car that you don't even have anymore. <laughs> like I'm not saying I love to see people get hurt, but at the same time, I do kind of like to see idiots get hurt. A little bit of uh, as instant as, justice is yeah. nice. Hopefully it's not like, you know, killing them. Streetcar Takeover them got a bad rap on that deal because bad naming. Like the event yeah. Streetcar Takeover and like they were doing that before Street Takeovers realize, were like a thing. I didn't realize that. So, and, yeah, people probably associate the two now. Yeah, so now it's like, oh, streetcar takeover is coming to, you know, Chicago or wherever. Oh, like, we don't need that in our city. Yeah. Get that crap out of here. And they have no idea what it even is. Meanwhile, they're the complete opposite of mm -hmm. that. Like, come to the track and race your car. So that's bad rap on that deal. They got some bad PR. <laughs> Dude, I feel like we got to talk about you being a dad now. I know. It's on its way. Congratulations, man. Thank you. I got a young Bugetti on its way, man. A baby Bugetti. Oh, it's, Are it's you a excited little bit for that? Of, it's a little scary, but I think I'm ready. Did well, Bounty say you have to sell any of the race cars yet? Um, She hasn't said I had to sell any yet, but she does want a Tahoe, which might require selling of something. Didn't you have a Tahoe? I did. And you got rid yeah. of it? Did you trade it? I traded it for a great family car. It was an SRT4. Oh, yeah, I remember that. It's a great thing. family okay, car. Yeah. <laughs> Weren't you going to sell the wagon at some point? Or you were thinking about selling the CTSV? I will sell that thing in a heartbeat. But it's that would be a perfect family car. It would be a great family car. I'll sell that thing in a heartbeat, though. I, I have a no reason to keep it. No. Most of my cars I'm not super you're attached kid, to. Kid seat in the back, and yeah. there you go. She wants a you Tahoe. Maybe get rid of my truck, get a Tahoe, get like an RV would be nice. Kind of do like a little trade-up deal, because I could tow my trailer with a Tahoe, but I could also tow it with a truck of, with the uh, with RV. The so it would be kind of like a good deal. Like if I was just going local to the track, you could tow it with a Tahoe pretty easily. And then if you want to go a little farther, you just mm -hmm. bust out the RV, mm -hmm. bring the whole family out. Exactly, because it's going to be hard to bring a wife and a child to the racetrack. With It'll be you. a lot easier with an RV. Yeah, it would be a lot easier. That's that's I'm where it's going to be with tough. The, like hotel and all that. It's just you show up. I'm usually pretty bad about hotel stuff too. Like when we were we in all our, when we were you in indie. <laughs> Me, you and Mike. I actually owe Mike money for that, and I don't know if I'm going to pay him because I don't think he's our. I don't think he's <laughs> deserved it. <laughs> that hotel was the worst one I've been to in Indy. The one we were at. Yeah, that was my worst that's, one I've stayed in. That's I probably think. about number three. Really? You stayed in worse than that? Oh, yeah. On one of the, it was one of the race weeks or sick weeks, we went to one and me and Emilio had to change rooms instantly. We walked in and it just smelled like someone just got done smoking a pack of cigarettes in there. Mm -hmm. It was that fresh. And we're like, 
We're in like the smokers area. There was one it we was did bad. stay at. I think we all stayed at one on Rocky Mountain Race Week. You had like this big queen room, like a big like suite all of a sudden or something. Was it that one? Because that was a pretty bad hotel. Yeah, I think there was one where we had to we had to get the suite because that's all that was left. I think I it remember. It was like I, yeah. twice as much as everything else. And I was like, well, we have no choice. I don't think that one was Pueblo, though. I feel like it was like Kearney or something. Yeah, I don't remember where that was at. But those are tough because you go through these small towns where there's, you know, 200 hotel rooms mm -hmm. and you show up with 350 racers and you're like, oh no, what do you do now? Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of like, you. the math doesn't work. And all the, all the decent hotels get booked up real quick and you're left with, especially us, last minute, yeah. finding what's left. You know, after calling like three hotels, yep. they're like, oh, we got a room. We go there. It's just... This place sucks. Well, on sick week, like it's it's tough. I I worry about booking hotel rooms early because I feel like that's a bad omen to not making it to those hotels. If you book all your hotels out, you're not making it past the first day or something like that. Yeah. And that's what I always try to like avoid, like knowing that like if I just wing it, I may make it there. But if I plan it all out, I'm probably yeah, you're not gonna, gonna make down it. First day. Yeah, we we I'll usually get the first night planned at a hotel. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Because I was like, I don't know if we're going to make it past that. We might break down. Most hotels require you to like put the down payment on the room or even pay for it up front yep. to hold it. And I was like, I'm not going to spend, you know, $1,000 up front for a whole week of hotels where we might blow up the first night. Yeah, especially if you have like, you sometimes you have to stay somewhere that night. Like where yeah, you dress or if you raised. had an issue with the car and you just don't have the time to make it that night and you're yep. behind your own schedule. I mean, it's race cars and you're planning it out that everything will go perfect. We'll make it to these spots. I got really lucky on the first sick week that we did where my buddy who planned it all out didn't make it. So I got all of his hotel rooms mm -hmm. that were prepaid for. That <laughs> like worked we, out perfect. I just had you. to make it to the hotel and I almost made it all the way. But that was a... Uh, that was a sad one. Good old transmission let go on the last drive. That was in chip, right? <laughs> yep. And that was that when you guys had the axle issues. Over yeah, the first we had time. the hatch and you stopped at that truck stop. Yeah. You guys had all kinds of ax axle issues. We are at OSW for hours. Yeah, it started pouring too and I had to change my rear axle with a little tent mm -hmm. or a little umbrella that someone brought. And there was like 40 people just standing around not yeah. really knowing what to do. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> That's where it gets tough sometimes when you're on that deal and you're just like stressed, struggling, and people are just kind of like, hey, how you doing? And you're just like the same question over and over again. As nice it is it as it is, and I respect <laughs> it and all the fans and everything, it's always the same question. Yeah. It's like, hey, how's it going so far? And you're just like covered in like axle grease and you're just like, it's going yeah. great. <laughs> Trying to put the balls back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are fun. Rocky Mountain Race Week, I guess, obviously, you're not going, even though you're already up there. You decided yeah, to. You would think that would be the one we'd go to, but. That's that's going to be a tough one going forward where they're going to be losing tracks. Yeah, I don't know what they're. I mean, the whole point of Rocky Mountain Race Week is like Bandemir. Yeah, it's kind of. Because you don't really have that thing. path through the Rocky Mountains without Bandemir as one of the stops. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, like the focal point. And then. What's the other one? It's not Kearney. It's SR, SRS or something. Had all kinds of problems with their surface where it has like a bump in it now. Which something one crazy. That? The other track that you go to on Rocky Mountain Race Week, the one that's just like a wide open nothing. I can't remember the name of that track. It's a pretty nice one though, but they had like redone their surface and they like. That's not the one that used to be the it. airstrip, right? It was the one that Cheyenne raced that crazy dude at. I th yeah, I think that used to be a was an old airstrip. That makes sense. Yeah, when Cheyenne raced, uh, yeah, the dude in the Daryl Walker, the Taycan, yeah, Walters, the uh, yeah, the guy that went missing. That was crazy deal. That was wild. Did you get to meet that guy? I was right there when he came back up around, trying to get it like a rematch with Chet because I think Chet beat him on the first one. He came back around and, like wanted to do it again, or mm -hmm. yeah, he was talking kind of crap to all the guys. He was trying oh, yeah. to raise Garrett. Yeah, at he was first. trying to raise Garrett. Yeah, and then. which come to think of it, like, how did he even know Garrett? Like, how did he even know anything about yeah, anyone know. there or anything? Like, how did he know? Like, oh, this is the guy I'm gonna go to and call out. 
That guy was crazy, dude. And he went way past the. He's lucky that that was like an old air airfield because it went, you know, like a mile out there afterwards. But he went so far past the finish cones, just still like 10 Mississippis full throttle yeah. past the finish. He was probably going 120 in the quarter and 150 when he hit the brakes. <laughs> I think he was going like well over that even. I don't remember, but he was moving. And a heavy ass electric Tycon. <sighs> yeah, that's a tough one. That is um that was a crazy deal. Do you miss Colorado at all being here? Because I feel like Florida is very like sterile in a way. Like it's like very like it's a little like bleak. Like all like there's no like mountain ranges or anything like cool to look at when you're driving. It's just like these boring highways and all like the same restaurants and stuff. It feels like Yeah, I feel like you get that feeling no matter where you're at if you've been there for a while because you could argue like the beaches are cool and yeah like we don't get any of the views or nice i mean we have actually really good sunsets with the mountains but we don't get the beach you know like i think traveling even just coming here like going over the bridges coming over the water like to mm -hmm. me is cool stuff like that whereas i mean you got a lot of awesome beautiful spots in colorado but after you've explored all the rocky mountains and you've been up there several times for years of your life yeah. You start to say the same thing. Oh, we got we got the mountains, but that gets old quick. Yeah, I feel like there's just like not really much outdoors, like like walk like like go on a safe walk where you're not going to get killed by an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, no, there definitely is more. Uh, there's more to do outdoors in Colorado as far as like camping and hiking and all of that stuff. Yeah, and, like, that's rock crawling is really big out there. Maybe maybe I'm just miss misusing the state but yeah I don't, I don't see all that much of that no i i agree i do miss some parts of colorado it's fun going up in the mountains i miss a lot of my friends over there but i also i like how consistent the weather is here because some people don't think it's consistent here but con uh, compared to colorado this is very consistent weather you pretty much get the same thing every day yeah and then when it's raining rainy season it just rains the same time every day but you can Look at a weekly forecast in Florida. It's like 82 perfectly for a whole week, whereas in Colorado, you you get like every season in a day. A yeah, couple, we a get lucky times with a week. that. Like we I don't... showed up to Colorado. It was beautiful. I'm like, man, this mm -hmm. is so nice. Next day, still super nice. And then out of nowhere, within 30 minutes, it's like hailing, like, you know, pretty big hail, like chunks of hail, like yep. thunderstorms going crazy, got super cold. It's just all over the place over there. Yeah, I think our average, like we... Probably throughout the whole year, we have like a 20 degree swing of temperature, which yeah. is like a very small margin. I saw I saw a meme and it was like Florida's first day of summer <laughs> at the beach and it's all nice and sunny. It's like every other day of Florida. It's the yep. same exact picture. I have seen some cool water spouts and stuff, though. That seems fun. Yeah, because yeah, you also don't get any of the watercraft like you do out here. Because if you're into that, like I like the jet skiing and yeah. doing all that. It's not as big in Colorado. I feel like up there that some of the lakes get like some pretty big like jet boating though where they have like maybe that's more like Ozarks area where they have like people do like all out on the jet boats like Finnegan's and stuff like that. Maybe it's like a California thing. Yeah, if they did it in Colorado, I wouldn't have really known about yeah. it. There's not many times of the year where it's it's you can always go out on the water out there, but it's not ever going to be as it's never going to be as like warm and as nice as the water is here, even at the best times in Colorado. Mm -hmm. There may be a couple months out there where it is really nice, but it's just everything in Colorado, you have to do it in a specific window of time. If you want to drag race, you got this time of the year. Mm -hmm. If you want to do this. So the thing that sucks about it is when you get to do all that stuff, the hiking, the everything you want to do, you have to fit it all within, you know, half the year because the next half is going to be cold and you're not going to want to, go out and do anything yeah you only have like three or four months unless to you're really the, unless you're into the snowmobiling and then snowboarding skiing all that as well yeah i was never there in the winter i was only there for rocky mountain race week and it's really nice i try to avoid snow as much as possible from coming from somewhere where we get snow and cold i try to avoid that as much as i can because it's hard to want to do anything work on anything or freaking wrench on a car in the cold yeah i could never get myself to work on stuff when it would snow it was really tough and i'd have to do it for videos and the house we had there luckily had a had a heated garage because if i didn't have that i would have got nothing done and i'd much rather come into a 
uh, air-conditioned shop to work on my car out of the heat and then to come out of the cold into a heated shop mm -hmm. and like try to warm myself up and you push a car in that's covered in snow it melts waters everywhere and it's just not a good situation it's just yeah. it's not as nice as it is just to push into an air conditioned shop everything's clean you're not tracking mud with the snow and everything yeah that that's where it would definitely get tough it's funny when you guys bought that place down here like you you just kind of like bought it i don't know if, who you talked to but i was like oh he just already bought the house like i don't think you really like I don't think you really, like, knew the area enough to even, like... I just saw it on maps, and I was like, <laughs> it's within an hour to Bradenton. <laughs> Call it good. Yeah, I was like, oh, dude, you could have, like, asked me. I could have, like, helped you out a little bit, because I know I, this real estate area down here pretty well in some of the areas, but... Yeah, I was looking in Bradenton, too, but that one came up, and I had Amelia's brother Ricky go and look at it for me. Yeah. And he sent me, like, two videos on his iPhone, just upright, just, like, a little video tour of the place, and I was like, it's good enough. Yeah, I mean, it had a shop and plenty of driveway and parking, and it is pretty much the perfect yeah, setup for you guys. Yeah, and it was guys. a great price and everything, so. I always tell people that because it's so much easier to just have a house with a shop than try to, like, have a house and rent a shop somewhere. Because, like, if you had to do that, had to have both, it would just be, it'd just be double the cost, probably. Yeah, I'm actually, I've been actively, actively looking either for a bigger property with a house and shop or an entire just industrial building warehouse mm -hmm. that we could still keep our house and drive to if it's close enough or if i found something good enough we just uproot everything and just move somewhere within you know not not something too far from where we are now but just something reasonable but right now everything's just so crazy that i don't think i'm going to find anything soon because even like even our property since we have moved there is nearly doubled in value just everything is crazy right now mm -hmm. so I just yeah don't you could think probably can... do pretty well off of selling your house if you move somewhere too yeah i know somebody that's looking at a place out in like my aka area which is like if you just take 70 past the track and go all the way out there yeah there's some good stuff over there we'll spot out I just there i want to go too far out of the too far into the country to where we're just out in the middle of nowhere i want that balance of where i'm still like 10 15 minutes from a Walmart, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be half an hour away from a grocery store. That's what ideally. I, I tell Bronte all the time. I'm like, I would love to be on like five acres and have animals and just like be out far away from everything because I hate sitting in traffic to go anywhere. Like you just yeah, want to go to the terrible. grocery store and you sit in traffic. Like for like little minute things, just frustrate me so much because it just makes you want to try to avoid that at all costs. But yeah. we like our neighborhood, so we kind of like. I feel like now I'm really stuck. <laughs> yeah, I really in it. I really got myself stuck here. <laughs> Somebody had to freaking get some woman knocked up. <laughs> <laughs> freaking Bronte. <laughs> but we were trying for a while, so it adds up. Yeah, I know um, out there is kind of cool. The person I'm talking to about has a pretty cool idea of what they're doing out there, too. They're going to do something cool, which would help with aircraft. But um, that would be a... It would be nice if you could move out there and really have a lot of property to do some like crazy stuff because with YouTube, you almost want to be able to do controlled chaos. And if you don't have like enough property to do like crazy stuff like whistling diesel, you know, obviously not his mm -hmm. level, but he has all the property where he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, imagine if he was in a neighborhood. Yeah, it's not going to hurt it. Like he's not going to just like hurt someone. Or, like, affect a family's day or something like that. Yeah. Maybe the power lines if he takes them out. He'll find a way. Yeah, so, like, something like that would be cool. Like, a nice big hill would be convenient for pushing things down. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely... That's one of the main reasons we want to find somewhere to go is just because we don't have enough room to do anything because we got a little asphalt pad. We can mm -hmm. whip a couple donuts, but... You know, that's about all we can do. I'd really love to find a place that's open enough to even, like, pave our own little stretch of road. Even if it's, even if it's like, 400 feet worth of road just to, like, do little test hits on. doesn't even need yeah. to be a drag strip. And then just have enough land and area where we can play around, like, kind of shake down the cars. Like, just do little fun stuff with them. But anytime we want to do anything, we have to put it on a trailer, come all the way out here. Yeah. Or just, you know go somewhere because you can't really rip them on the street 
Like Yeah, and we're not in a our area is pretty busy, so it's not like if we were out in the country, we could just go rip it down our country mm-hmm. road because we're not going to hurt anybody. No one's going to be out there. But hit a cow and that's it. Yeah, it's whatever. But <laughs> um, where we're at, yeah, I can't just comfortable like you rode in the NSX. It's there's not any there's no good places for us just to go out and rip the car. We got stuck or, in traffic in the NSX. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if we're going to be able to even rip on this thing. Yeah. There's so many people out right now. Yeah, that that gets tough. I mean, same with my neighborhood. Like if I go try to drive anything that's somewhat loud. Like I had 1320 down here. They still haven't posted that video, but we had I had 1320 video down here, and they did like a garage tour, and we took the Camaro out, and I was like trying to get on it a little bit, but like you need a significant amount of runway to get on a drag car. Like that thing, you know, if you look 800 feet down the road, like it's gonna be there pretty quickly. And yeah, I take that really seriously now because I if I'm on the street. I know I'm going to do a pull. Like, I make sure I give myself enough room to slow down. And then I also give myself enough room. Like, what happens if the brakes fail? Do I have a, mm-hmm. a little ditch plant? Like, I need a place to go or I'm not yep. even going to risk it because it's just. I pulled the parachute oh, <laughs> going nice. by him. <laughs> yeah, like, we did, like, like a little pull and then dumped the chute on the street. And Fred didn't even notice. Like, he couldn't even feel it. I was like, oh, yeah. Probably weren't going fast enough to really. Yeah, I was, I was, like, driving with it out. So it looked, like, all out for the video but they still haven't even posted that video they freaking bumped garrett's up in front of me <laughs> <laughs> dirt bags <laughs> but that was a fun one um dude so we were talking about ai tuning for cars <laughs> i had a feeling that was going to come up well because i talked about it with like every time i've brought it up with somebody they're like oh no it's not going to happen and i'm like okay you just don't see like what's going I, on i definitely think it's gonna and then happen. when i said it to you you were like oh yeah it's coming i was like finally somebody that like <laughs> I can actually have a conversation about with this because everybody else that I talk to is like, it doesn't make any sense. That wouldn't happen. But if you can give something enough data logs to know what's good and bad, I feel like it could very efficiently do that. Yeah, I mean, the AI stuff's proving that it can be very useful. And yeah, when it comes to, it's one, like they're trying right now, they're trying to make AI control like emotion and human response and feel like a real person you're talking to this and that but when it comes to just tuning numbers and data yeah and if it can go back and um you know just build up a database of what works and what doesn't and where things should be and where they shouldn't be then i don't see that they can't i don't see why they couldn't implement that into tuning software yeah if you have enough data points on your car like something like mullet has a ton of data points drive shaft you know everything like it can have like all kinds of things that my car doesn't have you know shock sensors and like all every wheel speed traction controls and stuff like that like once you have enough data to give it i mean there's no reason why it can't interpret that data a thousand times faster than any tuner yeah no and it will do it to the best of its cloud of knowledge of what works best Mm -hmm. because like ai is just uh like chat GPT is just a, it's just our collective information mm-hmm. on the internet everywhere. And it just browses that scans it for the best answer essentially. So if you're saying my shocks did this on this pass, where, where how should we tune the suspension to, I mean, that's more of a physical thing yeah, that but it would if have it to could tell you to do, tell but, you what to do. Yeah. Cause it yeah, might it have should, to, it should say, well, based on these, you know, thousands of other people that are also using the soft because it's going to take a lot of people using it to make it work yeah one person uses it it's not going to know what to do but if it has a collective kind of cloud that's where the issue could come into where people don't want to share their secrets and stuff like that but if they let everyone share what works best and then build a software off that well that's where everything that's where like one tuner in particular that maybe tunes a lot of you know ls fox bodies he can compile all of his data into like a personal basically network for his own tuning. And when he uploads a tune, it could kind of scan every other data log. It knows all the other data and it could kind of pinpoint to get to the best example based on his own experience. And then you have your own like proprietary deal going instead of like an open source to anyone. Yeah. I mean, even if, even if it wasn't, even if it didn't have to be smart to make the decisions for you, it could just be a tool to where it says, 
when I'm in boost at these boost levels, I just want it to see this AFR the whole time. And you floor it, and in real time, I mean, just in a couple pulls, it can just sit there and scramble mm -hmm. all the numbers for you in real time and reach your target. Even though if it's the number you want, it might not be the best, but you tell it, yeah. make it, make the car run like this at this RPM, and it can just do it for you way quicker and more efficiently. Well, especially if it's reading like small things like, you know, um, transmission converter pressure and things like that, and then also like has things like coolant pressure, so like it can know the health of the engine, and then you have like crankcase pressure, but it's also would be sampling from your first dyno pole and what that did versus current and how different it is. And like, even like the Coyote guys, they, they know, they measure their chains and they can know the stretch on the chain when to replace it. So they, they check like their first pass and the chains were this stretched. And then they can check like their current passes and know how much they've stretched to when to replace them before they break. Hmm. So like there's things like that that you, as a person, like you may not pick up on that because you're not going to look at that all the time. Yeah. But like this, like a good tuner assistant, I guess you could say would find that out because I mean, instantly it's, it's already kind of on that path because I mean, even in like Holly or the fuel techs right now, when you, you like close loop, even yeah, or Hall tech, all of them. Yeah. You run the wide band and you have the computer correcting for you on the fly. But if you just have, a system to where it's also not only just correcting but then going in and making those changes for you mm -hmm. on the fly and giving you just the best possible tune i would imagine at fuel tech they're looking into it pretty good yeah anderson said that they've thought about it i don't know how deep they've dove into it but yeah that would be a cool one to hear from somebody that i think like him yeah if, really if drag knows. racing continues to go on for you know years to come then i'd think it's inevitable that you know company especially like them they're getting a lot of traction they're going to always push mm -hmm. to innovate the next thing that one of them's going to find a way to incorporate ai with it because that's what every company is doing right now is finding out how ai can help streamline their efficiency and make things just work better if anything it would probably start in like a formula one or a nascar where they have yeah you know that's probably something 500 million we're dollars gonna, a year yeah us home built guys we're just gonna get the freaking yeah the scraps of what's left of that but because if you look at like get all, they're gonna get all the good shit yeah because if you look at like formula one technology exactly. that stuff is insanely yeah. high forget level. the drag racing yeah you look at formula one if they can start scrunching numbers after every lap and they see what was our best lap well they're and live they're live tuning in the yeah, cars. I, I'm sure they got it down even already. NASCAR is live connected to the cars and making adjustments as it goes yeah, like in real time? Yeah, in real time. Yeah, once you get AI doing that. Way quicker than any it's freaking guy on a laptop can do it. Yeah. I think they use, they used to, they They're use like a McLaren I'm sure, I'm sure they're already in, like working on it right now. I wouldn't be surprised. The first early adopters are going to be the ones that really shine with it. So like Mercedes may already have it, but they're keeping it quiet because you don't want Red Bull to get it. <laughs> Yeah. And start using it. So yeah, if there's a way to monitor like the tire temps and the fuel level and you know that that's changing the weight of the car by this or the traction yeah. percentage by this, then the car is just sitting there just And you could have 50 tuners. The perfect tune as yeah. close as you can make an internal combustion engine just that'll go be really fast. cool. Like I feel like there's so much streamlining that could happen on some of these cars that they could run way better than they are running now. Nothing against tuners like you know, they're, I mean, I already have Alpha at induction. He's technically AI. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's, I mean, you'll, I don't know if he's going to mess with your car at all. I think we're going to bring it over there, yeah, once it's done. You'll realize, I mean, he he's very similar to a computer, the way that he that's works. That's kind of how Anderson is like, at Fuel Tech. He's, he's a computer. He just I think that's how tuners he, usually they are. They just know, just know formulas and uh, conversions, like, right away. Mm -hmm. Just, oh, I need to convert this to this, and he just whips up a little computer. Like, when we brought my MR2 there, based, like, it was on a, no tune in the car, basically just enough to get it running. He just went through, like, what injectors, what fuel, how much power are we trying to make, mm -hmm. this and this. And we just plugged in stuff, and within two or three pools, it made, like, the 1,400 or whatever it was. Or at that time, it was, like, 1,100, but yeah. it was just, like, nothing. Yeah, that's so wild. That's such, like, a different brain than it's, I have, the tuners I have. Yeah, like, they just built, like, they just put the numbers in for what it should theoretically do, and it 
you know, it hmm. performed. It wasn't the the trial and error phase like I'm used to where, you know, it's breaking up, sputtering, like, oh, let's add a little fuel in this spot. It's mm-hmm. like, no, they, they calculated out the whole table before it even, you know, was a thing. Yeah. Fuel Tech has a really cool business model, how they get all those cars to come into their facility. I feel like that makes them so much more well known just by like having these big time cars like yeah they get show up to so their dyno cool cars in there. That makes it such like a cool deal. You were just up there for the school, right? Yeah. How was that? Was that pretty good? Yeah, it was you guys pretty good. A lot. Yeah, I I would say I learned a lot more than like Wyatt because he was there with me, but um, it's definitely good if you're just trying to get familiar with the fuel tech software, and they just get you familiar with. Like starting it up, you know, getting all your parameters right, how to set your crank trigger, and then they, they yeah. start to just run you through all of their hotkeys and like just try to make you, you know, efficient at using the software. Yeah, why it's a good tuner. I've I've yeah, he's feel like he's grown a lot, a lot since I first saw him ton. messing with your cars, especially on the fuel tech stuff. I imagine that's a lot more straightforward than like if he was doing like a Honda or something. Yeah, the fuel tech does make it like a lot easier. It's way more user friendly but yeah like even if i'm messing with a Honda data right now he's like he's like you know those things better than me like you yeah. figure it out but he's gotten really good at the fuel techs because you know when we first started doing it we didn't really know nothing so now between just me and him we're like doing all the tuning on the mr2 ourselves figuring it out yeah Honda data is an interesting one because that's like where brett brent got into all of his hot water was like yeah he got selling into some, those i think that's what the lawsuit or the fine was all about was because it was because a Honda is a factory uh, ECU that they put a chip onto. So it's like tampering with factory equipment essentially. Yeah. So he got what, like $30,000 in fines from that deal or something. I think it was like an $18,000 fine or something. I don't remember. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I feel like I haven't heard much about, I think he's still dealing with it too. I know. I just haven't heard that much about it. I don't know if maybe I just need to, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but I've heard, like, the EPA talk going down lately. I don't know if that means they're backing off some or they're, like, I don't know where that's headed. Yeah, I feel like it's, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really heard many people talk about it, but. Because, like, last year, it was, you know, you're hearing it from every shop. Watch out, EPA's Mm -hmm. coming. They're going to shut you down. But I wonder if that's because SEMA PRI kind of slowed down on their push to it because maybe they've backed off thinking like I feel like maybe they thought oh like we actually can't do anything so they slowed down with their push because why keep waving the flags around and drawing attention to something that you can't actually fight effectively yeah that's my worry is like did they stop promoting what they're doing because they've realized they've kind of lost yeah I don't know I know Turn 14 is doing a lot of fighting on their own as well, which is cool to see. Yeah, if anyone's going to put up a fight, it's those guys. They have a lot of money (laughs) invested into inventory they need to sell. It's just such a big industry that I don't know where it's going to go in the future. Like, do you think, how how long do you give it until every car is self driving on the road to where you can't drive your car? To where you can't drive your car. I don't know. That's a scary thought. I don't. I, I don't really ever see us at a point where... I feel where, like when it comes, it's going to come in like a few years. Like I feel like it's going to be like a few year transition and all of a sudden we're not allowed to drive cars I, without self-driving anymore. So if they did like a test, like they had like a city and every car in that city was self-driving and they could tell that they lowered accident rate 80%. Even if it was 20%, which, yeah, you know, with hundreds of thousands of deaths a year, they're, they're saving... 10, 20,000 people. But you would have to prove it in that, in like in that proof to even like get me to consider it. Because if you're going to try to push something that doesn't have like, yeah, real well, world data, it's like, gonna be I tough. obviously don't want it to happen. But no, I enjoy driving I'm, my car. Yeah. No, I like, I love <laughs> driving Wago here, mm-hmm. exhaust out the hood, you know. But at some point, it's just, they keep, they keep pushing it farther and farther, and the data is going to show that most accidents are going to be caused by human error. At some point, that that transition yeah. is going to become very clear, because even in my Tesla Plaid, I'll be like slightly distracted, not paying attention. I, like if I drift off the road at all, the steering wheel will just correct me. It'll go do 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 and mm-hmm. just turn for me and keep me going straight. 
and the better and better that technology gets to where the cars can drive themselves, which they're like getting so close. Yeah. It's it's it sucks because I feel like they're gonna make that call to where we need to we need to push this. Yeah, like it's too dangerous. Yeah, it's too dangerous. These people All are freaking cavemen out there too stupid. crashing into each other. Yeah, we can't trust the American people to drive themselves to work anymore. Yeah, it's going to be for our safety. You know, yeah, everything. Quote, unquote, <laughs> for your safety. Everything's always for, your safety. for the safety of the people. Yeah, ah, man, that's a scary thought. But then, then, like, how do you do that, though? Because I guess the push to fuel-efficient vehicles does that pretty well because California is going to eliminate gas-powered vehicles by, what, 2035 or something, they said. Like, no gas vehicles at all on the road. So once you do that, you're already forcing people to have to buy new cars because yeah, it's, it's like it's already coming without even if it's you not have an old sudden, car, but it's yeah. they're basically saying it's coming. And if their incentive is to push electric cars in the future, all new electric cars are going to come with self-driving because, you know, if I'm buying a brand new car and I could get a Tesla that drives itself, obviously the competitors' cars are also going to include mm-hmm. the self-driving AI software. And I'm just saying there's going there's going to be that transition to where if enough people do get electric cars that are self-driving, they're just going to see one year, like, damn, none of these self-driving cars caused any of these accidents, essentially. It's all yeah. human error. So now we have the power to make them all self-driving. we got to push this out there. Yeah, I Kind wonder, of just like how every car needs a seatbelt. Will it not even have a steering wheel at some point? <laughs> yeah, that, I don't... Who knows? That would be really crazy. I, I heard Elon Musk say, like, we basically don't even need seat belts in most new cars. I now. heard that <laughs> because they're so safe, anyways. That like the seat belt just kind of like I still don't really fully, do much. Like I, I understand his uh, concept. Like you don't need it, but I think it will always be there because it's yeah. one of those things that's simple, and still would adding the seat belt on top of the airbag would just like even double that. Safety. I mean, there's still if you're in a roll up, if you're in a rollover somehow, yeah. even if all the airbags go off, I would rather have a seat belt on than. Than not so. for sure. I mean, there's still ashtrays on airplanes, so talk about things that are useless. <laughs> well, it's, I think it might have been him that said it, but back when they s- started making elevators automatic, when you just hop in an elevator and push a button, mm-hmm. before that, in like I don't know if it was like the 1930s, I could be way off, but somewhere around there, elevators were manual and you had to get a person like what floor do you need to go to and they had a conductor and he would like manually take you up yeah, each floor and then it's kind of fun when they got rid of the elevator driver people would freak out they're like i don't trust that thing it's gonna like yeah. fall or something you're not taking me to the right floor <laughs> and now us growing up as kids with as when we see it when we're a young kid and that's just what we're accustomed to it doesn't even seem weird to us so it, right it, now the generation being born coming into self-driving cars yeah. 30 40 years from now they're going to be like, they're going to look at people who drove stick shift cars like, damn, that was a wild time. Yeah, there's not going to be any stick shift cars. It's wild how safe elevators are. When do you ever hear of people like dying in an elevator? It's usually Pretty much like, never. The only thing that happens is they usually get trapped. Yeah, but they usually get them out. Like those yeah. things are freaking extremely safe. I've heard somebody talking about that. They're like, if like 0.1% of, you know, planes were crashing, you'd be very nervous. Yeah, but like the percentages are so low on things like that, especially like on planes. Like, freaking air travel is so safe now. It is so safe, and that's like one of those things. If you just gave everyone there, if you like, if you gave everyone a jumbo jet and an ex- experimental pilot's license, you're gonna have a lot more issues. It's fine. So yeah, I don't. I think we're a long ways off from like flying cars. Yeah, I don't know if that'll ever be a thing. Even though I know so many people that fly helicopters around now. If anything, it might be like like some sort of drone, like some four-bladed single-person taxi. Mm-hmm. That could be possible, but I still see so many issues with that. Yeah, especially the battery technology to carry a person. It's going to suck up a bird and go through someone's living room, and then that's that's over. Yeah, I don't think I trust <laughs> most people flying around over me. I don't trust most people driving next I'm to okay me. I'm okay with like the Amazon drones. And stuff delivering. Those are they're fun. trying to push that. That's okay. Did That's you see cool. our <laughs> Walmart see by our house has a delivery drone? Oh, really? Yeah. Did we haven't see? got to use it yet, but they we're like right on the edge of their uh, how far they can go. So we want to try it. The drone stuff is a little scary though. Them flying over, watching, and stuff. Did you see what happened with that Amazon delivery driver? Said that the guy said something racist to him. So mm-hmm. Amazon locked him out of his house, 
because they already had control <laughs> over his. Wait, Amazon locked who out? The owner. The guy that owned the house, they had control over his. So the owner ordered something on Amazon? He ordered something on Amazon. The Amazon driver delivered it, said that the owner of the house said something racist to him, reported it to Amazon. Amazon locked the guy's house because, like, he had the code doors. They had his air conditioning. They had his cameras. They were using his cameras to see if he said something racist. And, like, they basically just took over this guy's house for 48 hours. He couldn't get in. Because they... Damn. <laughs> And they, they like, this is, like, not even any... That has to be... When did that happen? It, like, happened, like, a week ago. And they even, like, came out. They are like, yeah, we did that. Like, sorry. Like, they so, even, like, they, like they admitted to it. For it. They admitted to it. I don't think they got in trouble. It's, I think it's probably in the terms of service that... But that's something they shouldn't be allowed to do, obviously, right? I would be taking those doorknobs off real quick. <laughs> that's pretty wild. I, I mean, mean, they... They can't it's one thing to be rude, mind. but it's just words to actually, like, <laughs> lock someone out of their house. On Based off of a guy's just, like, he just said that. Like, it was just, like, he said, she said. Like, they didn't even, like, have proof. Like, there's no trial or anything. They're just like, yeah, sorry. You're locked out, bud. <laughs> Damn. That's what everyone's big conspiracy about the electric cars is, is that once everyone has an electric car, that they can just shut them down. Yeah. Which, in a way, they could. So, I don't know if they're ever going to make a way to where you can have, like, a self-driving car, but it's still, like, you control it no matter what. And there's no way to, like, hack into it or mm -hmm. there's some firewall or firmware in there that just allows it to not be tampered with. Well, the self-driving is weird in itself because you have to buy it and it's, like, not transferable. So, like, you have to spend, like, five grand to unlock full self-driving. And then the next guy might have to do that, too. It's, like... It, it's weird like that on some of the Teslas. You can, like, rent full yeah. self-driving, lease it. Well, I heard the, the like, the long-term plan with it is to basic, from what I heard, is that they want to make all the cars self-driving, and then when you need to transport yourself, if you own your Tesla, you can basically rent it out. Like, like you can Uber your car. Yeah. Because the theory is, like, you bought this expensive car, you need it to transport yourself A to B, but most of the time it's just sitting there, you know, doing nothing when it could be making you money. And that's the financial incentive to you own the car, you buy it. And then while you're here right now, your car's out there delivering yeah. people when you don't need it because it's full self-driving. And then it's a it's a revenue split between you personally and the company that builds the car. So like, I don't know where all that stuff could go, but... Yeah, and then they'll be, like, ordering their own, like, tires. Like, oh, I just, needed some new tires, so, like, the it, car will just order it. Yeah, <laughs> just drive itself. But, and it sounds crazy to us, but kids nowadays already don't, I've, at least I've heard it. I haven't really seen it firsthand, but I've heard that kids don't even like to drive nowadays. They're already just very used to Ubering. That's mm -hmm. it. They hop in, go where they need to go, and that's it. And, they, and there's people out there that don't even care to own a car. Because they can get to where they need to go yeah. pretty easily. And with all the people working from home, creating content, social media, the need to travel to and from a, an office job every day is kind of not in their mind right now. Yeah, that's going to be a big issue in the next few years. Office buildings, there's so many empty ones. New York City, I'm sure Colorado probably has a lot of empty offices now. And like Tampa has empty ones. Like, Big office buildings. Yeah, it's like that are it, just it's some weird point. out. Yeah, that's a like that'd be a weird thing to think about if everyone. There's obviously the jobs that require physical labor that you have to be in person for, but a lot of those, you know, a lot of those jobs could be done remotely. Even though I don't think you'll be as productive that way. No, I don't think you so need, either. I, mean, I think it's important to have the employee there for the most part, but I mean, if it starts to go that route, it's like imagine all the major cities with their skyscrapers, everything just struggling to keep people in them. Yeah, and most of those, it's too expensive to even convert them to residential. Like, it's, they can't do the easy, plumbing, yeah, they can't do anything. Rebuild a new one. Yeah, so, like, they're just full-blown just stuck, and there's, like, this big push to get people back into them so they don't default on the loans on the buildings. Yeah. So they're trying to get people back to work just so that they don't default on loans on buildings. Yeah, I don't know where all that's going to go. That's going mean, to be I don't really know, I'm weird. uneducated on all that, but it's like I, I could see that being a thing one day where it's like, oh, we just got all these 
abandon skyscrapers because people don't need to go into the office to work because if they maybe and maybe there's something where the VR stuff gets good enough to where you're required to so to, to physically be there you have to VR into yeah. for, you can still be home but to get paid you have to be there virtually for a minimum yep. of eight hours a day and that solves the not showing up and then they they have like a work VR so it's it also like in makes the work it more VR, productive. Yeah, in the work VR, it won't let you go on YouTube. It's like you're here to yep. do your job, but you're still at home. So if something like that came into play, like office buildings, it's done. It would make it more productive too because you actually walk past the people every day and like that's the whole thing. Yeah, like and you're you'd not still like, socialize. You'd be yeah. like in that avatar VR world with them. Kids in school are done. definitely going to be going to school in those still things. Be getting, yeah, you'd still be getting work done. And then you know, as a whole, it would be way more efficient because you're not spending gas to go to work. You're not wasting that time. You just pop a VR headset on and go in. I'm ready to um, ready to drag race in VR. So, Indy, I or no Bristol. Limit. I got no limits if you want to go right now. Bristol coming up. Got a six-second bifer. Five-second, <laughs> actually. Bristol coming up. <laughs> Put me in a VR burnout car. I'll stay home. <laughs> That's where it's going to get freaking lame. <laughs> I'll stay home, just load it, just unload it for me, fire it up, and think. <laughs> However, yeah, I don't know how that's going to go either. I mean, realistically, a Tesla could easily drive VR. Somebody could easily remote pilot, a, remote drive a Tesla. You could, yeah, I'm sure someone could jailbreak one right now and drag race it from their iPhone if they really sure wanted to. Sure, Elon could fire one up. Oh, yeah, he probably has some tricks. I was actually thinking about that. I wonder if there's like an unlock where they're holding it back a little bit on like battery life and maybe like power and stuff. Kind of like, like how a combustion engine, like, you know, there's a little more timing or something you could squeeze out of it. Yeah. But like they have an unlock and like, if suddenly somebody's like, Oh, we have a Tesla that, or we have a new electric car. That's X amount better. He can just be like, Oh, well actually we're just going to sell an upgrade for all of our cars that are already out there. And then it just makes them like, like it's well, already in there. They did that with the plaid. I don't know as far as, the acceleration, but they just came out with a track pack like a few weeks ago. And if you buy it, I think you, you're supposed to take the car into a dealership and they put like carbon ceramic brakes on it. Mm -hmm. And it's for the plaid and it unlocks it to go over 200 now because the limiter right now is like 178 in track mode. Yeah. And then if it's not in track mode, it's like 165. Keep Cheyenne away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the last thing he needs right now. But yeah, they just posted it on their Twitter like a couple weeks back. And they, you know, the the mm -hmm. promo for it was like clicking just over 320 kilometers or whatever that is in uh, kilometers, yeah. but it's just going over 200 mile an hour. And they just came out with that. So now you can bring your Tesla Plaid to the dealership and, and like put it in track it mode. You. Go to like some track and if it has a long straight, hmm. it'll rip 200. I, I don't hear know if uh, it's... Cheyenne developed that with him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was his it was his car. That had, did you see that maybe thing when was, it was like... Maybe that's the reason they put some better brakes on those things. That would make sense. Did you see his car when it was like trying to break the record, how clapped out he had I that thing? I saw videos of it, yeah. Just all the door skins cut up and... No that carpet, thing. one seat. Like He should have tried to break the record before he drove it underwater. Yeah. Then you drive it underwater. For sure did that backwards. But that thing was in Kinda rough shot shape. shot himself in the foot with that one. Yeah. That was in rough shape. Did you see the um, the motor enclave they're building by you? Yeah, it's already up. Yeah. I haven't been there, but that it's like a $150 million deal. It's Bad nice. Ass. So they built this private, like, really badass racing facility where there's, like, I think, like, 200 suites where you get, like, a shop. Upstairs, there's like a loft area where you can like spend some time. I don't know if you're supposed to stay there. I think it's more just like a hangout and you get like your garage and then you have access to this track and they're on an airport, like a private airport. Yeah, they're right next to an airport. So they have an easement to it. So like they're connected to the airport. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know that. That's awesome. You can fly in and they pick you up on a golf cart. <laughs> you can go race your cars. I, I figured the the. The goal with that was to rent the condo if you're, you know, some rich dude that wants to run your Lambo or Porsche I think you just on the. Buy them. You just, I just figured you'd rent it and you can fly in on the weekend, even if you're not from Florida. You just yeah. fly in with some friends. Oh, you want to go to the track this weekend? We'll fly in. I got a place at the Enclave and go rip your Porsche around or whatever and it's and fly out. Pretty reasonable too, because like I think like a a thousand square foot 
garage with like a thousand square foot loft area was like three hundred thousand to buy, and you have and like you can just own it. You just own it. I didn't know that. I thought they were all only to rent. No, I think you just own them. Yeah, and they hold like four or five cars. And well, you can one. get like different sizes and stuff, and then you get the whole loft area, and that would be really fun to do some like road course stuff. Yeah, we. I thought about it. I was like, if that place goes up, I wanted to go take my Porsche around there. Yeah, I'm trying to get the guy that started it on here. Trying to get him on. Oh, here. really? Yeah, I was emailing back and forth. I with followed them. him on Instagram too because I was like, I needed an in at that place. It's it's less than ten minutes from us. Well, they're not done selling them yet, so I was like, hey, buddy, come on and tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, what <laughs> are you going to do to get on. in one of those? Yeah, hang out and be friends. I don't think they're going to have an issue getting rid of them, though. That place seems like it already has a lot of traction building it's up for it. such a good spot, too. Like, he is in the perfect spot because I heard him talking about it. He's like, yeah, and then the family has come down and, well, like, you go to the beach and then yeah. <laughs> you go racing. I don't know if it's true, but I heard there were rumors that they might try to put a drag strip there. That would be back on the drag drag strip topic. But if they did that, then I'm staying right where I'm at. Yeah. Then that would be perfect. So it'd be tough though, because it's not like a public place. I know you can spend, you can buy like a day pass to go there, but it's not like super public. Yeah. I don't know how they would do that. And like I said, it was just a rumor, but I heard that that might be a thing. I'm sure they could. And they're on an airport right next to an airport. So you already have all the noise, noise isn't going anywhere. It's like a highway and an airport right next to them. So they're in like the yeah, perfect no, they're, they're zone. Yeah, they're good to go. Yeah, they're they really also close have to a you. big, they have like a 30 plus thousand square foot event center building. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was really excited for that place because we don't really do any of our own meets or anything like that. But if, you know, we got to know those people over there and we could kind of host our own little things yeah. over there and kind of rent it out from them because I think that's what the building's for. That could turn into something. Out that would be cool to do, like, Booster Boys track days. Yeah. And just <laughs> Bunch of out. civics ripping around the <laughs> track. <laughs> just all fart. Like, it's all these dudes with their Lambos and yeah. McLarens. And it's just we invite all the fart cannon civics out. And we yeah. rent it out for a day. Bunch of oil their whole track Million down. dollar cars out there. <laughs> all the freaking oil specs where all the civics are parked. Yeah, I think that's one of our few tracks around here, too. Because it's just, like, that one, the firm, is, like, way north in Ocala. And then... You can go over to Sebring, which is pretty far southish. Yeah, I just drove to Sebring. It's not terrible, but yeah, it's pretty far. Yeah, it's not. It's not too bad. It's kind of nice out there, though. Remember when That's we were like out in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. Remember when we did all the Rob Ferretti stuff when we were out there? Yep. I let Garrett drive the minivan. Yep. I don't think I. To this day, that van's probably never been on rev limiter that long. Well, he was on the back. He was on the back stretch at Sebring with the crappy tires on it. And once he went into fourth gear, just rah, 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 rah. and it was like going slow because it wasn't catching any traction. So yeah. he literally went the whole back straight trying to accelerate, but he was on the throttle so hard that it just uh, wasn't going nowhere. Yeah, classic. That was a fun but one. It survived, dude. Freaking Ferretti is a master at planning. Like he planned Out of everything we've done. That was the smoothest. Like. YouTuber challenge event thing we've ever done. Yeah, no ready should do another one. That was like wild how well he put that together because we were in Daytona, we we're Sebring, we were uh, Ocala at the half mile, the Jumble Air, yeah, airport. the half mile, and there was something else we did. It was like multiple things that he was able to put together. I don't know how much it cost to rent Daytona, but I'm sure. And then he sent the winner to Germany. He's in Adam's car. Adam, and then I heard that was a whole thing. I'm pretty sure. The car got, like, stuck in customs, and they had to ship it back or something. It was funny because I was like, I was like, dang, I thought we won that to Garrett. And Garrett was like, I don't want to send Leroy to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think Ferretti wanted to send Leroy to Germany so either. worked out. Because <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. And then Ferretti had his Corvette there that was just, like, terrible. Like, I, that thing was... <laughs> I remember we showed up, and... I, I don't think he took us very seriously. He kind of that, that was at the time where people didn't take us serious. Like they saw us as the fun, goofy kids, mm -hmm. kind of like Hagger Garage style, just just doing whatever. Can you cut cut us on here? Yeah, sure. Oh, I didn't know. But um, yeah, we were just messing around. But we built the minivan, and he's like, "Oh, like yeah, you guys should." It was like a last minute thing. He's like, "You guys should bring it out. It'll just be fun." Like he his. I remember how he worded it. He's like, "It's not even about like." how you, good you guys do. Just come have a blast. Like, he's treating us like <laughs> this man's a piece of crap. Yeah. <laughs> and it's slow. But And then the day we did the half mile, we went 153 to his 154 in the Corvette. 
and we were like right after him and mm -hmm. he was like oh shit that thing's fat and we were like that was open dip like that thing would have went so much faster too just blowing the tires off yep we had a, a solid black line all the way down through the finish yeah i remember when we got to jumbo air you like took all the seats out yeah and set up basically a camp Garrett with the interior on do first day i met you guys yeah that was that was a fun ass trip though we had a that was a lot man weren't you the first one to kind of see us or discover us i guess because i think garrett messaged me and he was like my he's like cooper's been watching some of your videos he messaged me so long ago and he's like it's like we were thinking about like building a Civic. Maybe. And like inviting it us out been, or something. Could have been me. I don't know if I really remember. I feel or like no, for you, ready. Did you did you have like a Civic at some point a long time ago? Like a crappy Civic? We had one Civic? way long ago when that's we did when, Demolition that's, Drag that's Racing. That's when he messaged me. Yeah. You guys had some Civic and he's like, we were thinking about putting a turbo kit on it. When we first did Demo Drags, we did that. We had a Civic and I like gutted it to try to make it as light as possible to try to win. <laughs> classic civic move yep. <laughs> and that was yeah that was pretty good um but then one of the few one of the early times that we hung out was at um ice cream cruise when you had the red hatch out there mm. and it sucked the harness into the turbo yeah, <laughs> that yeah. Was, i can't believe that thing still ran after sucking a freaking it, harness into a turbo it was just a chassis harness it didn't affect the motor at all it kept going didn't affect just the chassis either no headlights or a lot of other things yeah, it was pretty good. Blew but that a was a fun fuses. one. Because I think we had neighbor out there that time. Mm -hmm. And we were... That was such a fun night. When we stayed up late, just ripping. That was so reckless that they just let us just like... That was. They just walked away and we had complete open track usage. In pitch black. <laughs> just pitch black. People going the wrong way at, at us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was... Because we, we did like some street rolls too. You guys were out there in Emilio's car yeah, at the time. I was roll racing neighbor in the hatch, and then he also, I think he raced Honduru first, and then yeah. did a couple with the hatch. And dude, we were hauling by because me and neighbor were really close. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't want to let up. I didn't want to let up. We were coming on that turn at the end, super hot, pitch black. We didn't have a good uh, reference to how far away we were mm -hmm. from the turn. I snapped a couple axles too, but. I always try to shout out Ice Cream Cruise because that is such a good event for people it's to go to. It's one of my favorites. I I just love the roll racing. I wish I could get there more. Just It's just such a trek for us down here. It is. And at least for you, you kind of use it as like a stopping point to get to Colorado. But like for me, it's like a it's just like a round trip and I just can't justify it. Yeah. But I always, if you don't anybody's really... in that area of Ice Cream Cruise put on by 1320 video, it is a charitable event and it is a must see event you just get to walk around look at all the There's cars so much, and eat ice cream so much there the best car show in the country like one of the best like car shows that you can go to then they do the drag racing and the roll racing all at the same time which is awesome yeah you don't really have anything that's set up for only eighth mile or roll racing alongside of each other <laughs> yeah like and you might be able to bring the camera out there and do some like eighth mile hits yeah, but that would be tough. I mean, I would roll race the Camaro. You would roll race it? I could. I mean, that thing would get down. But then it's then that's the same thing. You're, there's a lot of all-wheel drive that guys that go out there, and it's completely unprepped. Yep. That thing's probably going to get a little squirrely out there. Definitely sketchy. It went at Streetcar Takeover Darlington. It went 181 roll racing. So Down was, a track, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not on Not just on a random... But go kart road or whatever it is. In that car, like it doesn't have a rolling anti lag, so I was just like, Bah and then it finally like just hit, rolls into it, and it was all of it. Like the nitrous hits pretty well, but everybody I roll raced was two cars out on me <laughs> by yeah. the time it hit, which yeah. is very sad to be that guy. I would be very angry if I was like this dude and like I raced like this ZR1, and I came around him at like the last like ten feet of the track. And then I raced this uh, twin turbo R8, and same deal. Two cars out on me, came around him. And then they they made this post about it being like a full interior car, like racing these race cars. And I was like, Who cares, man? I, I got the trophy. So yeah, <laughs> I got the cash and the trophy. And you ain't making angry posts, so you know how that goes, though. People always try to like, not really. They're trying to like 
make themselves feel They're better justify by justify their loss, downplaying a little bit. I have no animosity towards them. I I get it. And, you know, you're trying to make yourself feel better. You got customers to make happy and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a funny one. Yeah, that's that's my favorite event though to bring like the the Rattacy. That's fun. Yeah, that's a good car roll racing. You guys broke everything last year, right? At Ice Cream Cruise? Yeah. Did you guys break the Routacy? Didn't Wyatt break it? That might have been the time. I, he definitely broke it on one of them. It might have been that. Might have been last year. We also brought the NSX, and it did really good. We were racing, like, twin turbo Lambos out there, and yeah. the NSX was getting down. Oh, yeah, the NSX was out there, too. I was thinking, um, when I was thinking about doing this podcast, I was like, man, I wonder how hard it is for somebody that has, like, the multiple different facets. So like the drag racing, like I'm in that lane, it's pretty easy. But then when you're like, oh, and then I have like a sand rail that I also want to try to use. And then I have boats that I also want to try to use. Like you start to like spread yourself pretty thin where like you end up not being able to use anything. Some of these like vehicles just, you know, if you keep building more drag cars, you'll just get to keep using those pretty easily. It doesn't take like a different work. Do you, do you yeah. kind of have that? Like, uh, I don't know. I kind of like I like doing something different to just kind of get me out of the norm because I think I get not really bored, but if I were just to drag race all the time, I think it would burn me out because I like all motorsports. I think anything fast and, you know, also kind of dangerous sketch, like whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Any, any of it I like. So I want to just try everything essentially so it's like i don't know if i like sand cars and sand rails or fast boats or i'll like i'll do whatever that's just you know souping something up and trying it but yeah it's definitely it's definitely tough trying to organize all of them trying to like juggle the time to do the different ones in a way yeah it's tough because you got to like each one has to like have their own like beast about them basically and they're they're all like nuanced in a way. Like you were out, didn't you take Razzle Dazzle to what Glamis? Did you take yeah. Glamis? Yeah, we took it. It was either last year or two years ago. Dude, how great is that place? It's pretty cool. It's just wild. It's like a different world. It's out scary there. how big it is. Yeah, you go out there on your own and you break down. Like you're you're out there. Or like you know you're following a train of people and maybe you end up in the bag, and you lose them a little bit, they're gone. Yeah, like <laughs> you. <laughs> they are gone. You are not finding them. Yeah, Glamis is really cool. We want to make another trip out there and just get that thing going again. But it's just so far. Such a trip. I just hate driving. Yeah, that's a that's like ship your stuff out there <laughs> type of situation just because it's like, that's I think why it's like 36 hours from here or something. That's why all of us just wish we could have the ultimate kind of complex compound where you just got everything. You got freaking a few acres of sand dunes. Mm-hmm. You got a drag strip. You got a big body of water. Just everything for all kinds of uh, just motor. Or at least craft. a location where things are closer. Yeah. Where like you can find some centralized location where yeah. you have these things close enough to go use them because. That's like California, the state of California would be really good. Like if it wasn't, you know, if they weren't so strict on everything over there, I would consider going there because of the landscape geographically it's the best state yeah they have everything they have all of the good stuff it's geographically the best state (laughs) yeah it's they got the water they got the sand they got snow isn't far they have everything yeah and it's nice weather just a couple hours away they got the avocados but they've just ruined it yeah (laughs) just slaughtered that whole state (laughs) yep everyone's leaving there yeah like we're done they're all coming to florida actually in texas Texas is kind of like our little buffer zone. Like yeah. they they start driving, they start driving <laughs> yeah. east, and they're just they hit Texas and they get stuck there. So Texas kinda, is our filter. Yeah, they slow them down a little bit. The real crazy. There's a lot of room in Texas. It's a pretty big state. They all go to Austin anyways, so that's fine. And then Houston just closed, so we're gonna have to go to Dallas next year for TX2K. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it does worry me that there's a lot more drag strips closing than opening. Yeah, I would be. I would be interested to know, like, the last five years what the net gain or decrease was. Because some have opened, but plenty have closed. I hear a lot more closing than opening. And Atlanta closed, which was one of my favorites and, like, one of the closest ones. I think people that aren't in the U.S. don't realize how big 
it is. Like when we're talking about like driving, we're not talking about like four hours here. If I want to drive to Michigan for streetcar takeover this weekend, we're talking 18 hours of driving, yeah. 20 hours of driving. Like that's days of time just in the car. Yeah, I just got done. Me and Wyatt both driving to Colorado and back within a couple week time span. I drove to Colorado from Colorado to Indy, back to Colorado, back to here. Like 6,000 miles in less than two weeks on my truck. Man, that's like almost needing, you know, new tires, brakes, and an oil change. Yeah, every, I had to drop it off, get the full service done. Yeah. It's like, geez. And then you get like you get worried about reliability. Did you see Taylor Ray's new truck mm-hmm. broke down? I was like, that's like biggest fear right there. Yeah, imagine having, like especially what we had planned. Like we were doing the S2000. We got the event in Colorado. Why it's like just, just the truck breaking down can ruin all that. Yeah. Because if we're one day late, if we don't give us ourselves enough time for something to go wrong, everything falls out of place. Yeah, the hairline deadlines are really tough sometimes. It's kind of crazy. Like, I feel like we get stuff done that I don't understand how we get done until it's over. I'm like, I don't mm-hmm. even know how we do all this on time. It's pretty crazy when you step back and just look at what some of these YouTubers mm-hmm. go through to like make shit happen. Some are really good at logistics. That's the tough part about this is you have to wear a lot of different hats. And if you don't wear them all like pretty well, like the car builder hat, the the logistics hat, getting parts in time, like all of those different things that you have to like include in this, the business side of things, which I hate dealing with like getting sponsors and stuff like that and like paid advertisements and videos, like all the necessary things. I hate that side of things. It's so, like, there's so many different hats that you have to wear. The graphic designer for your thumbnails, like, it's just endless. Yep. There's, like, a million different things. Kind of a jack of all trades in that aspect of it. Yeah, kind of of gets frustrating. What part of it would you like to hand off the most? I don't even know. Probably anything, I'd say, like, almost anything business-related. Yeah. If I could. If I could just know, like... Don't deal with any of the money, the, getting the sponsors, paying employees, any yeah. of that. Like if I could just dealing with my taxes, invoices, keeping receipts, yep. making sure I'm not buying too many parts this month, all that stuff. Like anything, if I could just stay working on the cars, making videos, having fun, and all that's not even a thought for me. Just do the creative side of yeah, things. Just yeah, just be fully creative only. Because that's be tough ideal. where, like, you know, you have to make these 45 decisions before you even get to be creative. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're already, like, decision fatigue. You're like, uh-huh. Just had to do 20 things before I even got into the shop. I'm sick of this. <laughs> yeah. In a perfect world, I wouldn't have to deal with any of that. And I would have, like, a full-time editor and film guy slash crew just filming, like, almost like Milk Boy style in a way. Yeah. Just kind of filming our camaraderie, seeing what we're doing. And it just it just kind of just flow content out. Would you post, like in a perfect world, would you post less videos or more? I don't know. I would post I would post as many quality videos as I could. That's the tough balance of like you could post daily if you have a lot, or you can slow down and post like top quality content every time you put out a video like some people do. Yeah, and it works for a lot of people that really commit to that. It's just scary if you do get a flop in there and you rely on that yeah, revenue source and you get a flop and everyone's like, well, are we getting paid this month? Yeah. And it's like if you don't have these other sources of income from sponsors and you have to have that cushion to know your, your parts are paid for, your guys are paid for, everything's good to go if you have some videos flopping. And then if they continue to flop, you're, you have one flop, you're going to instantly think, Oh, well, maybe it was just a fluke. You have a second, and if you don't fix that problem, you're going under real quick. Whereas, like, at least I feel like a lot of the daily guys, they don't have as much pressure as making sure the videos are perfect and good because they yeah. can just kind of throw up their day. Whatever happens, happens, and the viewers are already accustomed to, you know, it's a it's just a regular day in their life, essentially. Yeah. To whereas if you don't get some big, exciting video out, you're kind of – and you try to push something that's not quality 
that instantly hits your channel for like months to come and you have to like rebuild. And YouTube knows like they they know the analytics where if you had a bad one, they know they're not showing it to that person the next time if they didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And with how die by the algorithm it's getting, you know, people only have so much time to watch stuff right now. It's just everyone fighting for your clicks and the same views, views the same people. It's just nuts out there. I mean, you know, on the back but, end, we can see who, like our viewers also watched videos yeah and you know who people are coming from you know what stuff. subscribers are shared mm -hmm. and where they're being sent from and yeah i don't know what we would do but i i wouldn't be surprised if one if it could be sustained if it if i had the choice just and the success was there i would rather make like weekly good videos that did really well yeah because i think that would take a lot of stress off everybody as well if you just knew your audience was there. They were going to be here every this day of the week, and you mm -hmm. just have a banger video once a week or every couple of weeks, and that outweighs you know trying to post five, ten videos. You know who's really good at doing that is uh, Rich Rebuilds. He's really good yeah, at like he's not like a posting one, a lot. He's like a one a week kind of guy. But they're very like a full thing. Like it's like a full story every video. Yeah, you get the three minute story with, with yeah. the memes. And it starts <laughs> and ends in that yeah, video. Like you don't have to watch the next five videos to or the last five to know what's really going on. Like it's a yeah it's a storyline that he has good with. Yeah. I think and I mean with with everybody and that's the thing is with and the the creators that go that route I think we'll find more success as time continues just because of how competitive everything is getting. It's like people are only going to want to watch something that's kind of start to finish. And, yeah. and I think that's why you see those the guys that just make uh, less quantity but better quality. They, they stick out, they get views, and those videos continue to do good for them even years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have like they're evergreen in a lot of ways. Like Chris Fix. Yeah, like that dude's, he could be 40, 50, 60 years old and someone's going to watch his video how to change coolant if, you know, electric yep. cars don't take over. Yeah, he'll probably be on in the next, like, week or so or something like that, Chris, because he's, he's down here a lot now. Is he living in Florida or is he just down here a lot? He told me he was looking to move I don't know here, if it's so. for me to say. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I know that, that he's down here a lot. So... so. I know that he's down here a lot, so I was just with him the other day. He was down here at a car meet that he oh, had. Nice. Yeah, I've seen that you posted that when, like, Tavares was out there. Yep. So that'll be pretty cool. And his videos are crazy because how do you do yes. that but then also build a community? Like, he's somehow done both. Yeah, no. Where he has his, specific... His system's But, like, really they're specific good. to cars. So, like, if you don't have, like, that car, why are you going to watch the video on how to do brakes on it? There, he has a set of fans that watch him for him. I believe, and then there's just yeah. the mundane, you know, person that doesn't care about cars. They click on his video once, and that's the only time they'll ever watch he him. Hit ten million subs. Yeah, I mean, he was coming up on it. So, dude, it's wild. That's such a tough thing, and the, like what you were saying with like the people's eyes. That's why I wanted to start a podcast too, so I'm not competing in that same exact space that I've always been. You know, the past like few years dealing with. That same, like, you have to one-up yourself all the time space. Yeah, it gets tiring. And this way I get to hang out with my friends and talk to people in, like, a chill environment. I'm not competing for that same space because somebody's driving, listening, or, you know, working or doing something like that. So I kind of get a different crowd. Yeah. Like, I, I'm kind of running in a different space now with this stuff. And then I get to just do racing videos in the end. <laughs> yeah, just kind of on the side. Just what I really enjoy, so I get to like kind of spread them out a little bit, and I don't have, I don't feel like I have like a need for like constant filler videos, which really hurt the channel. Like anytime you're doing like a that, probably filler takes some stress off. Not like knowing you don't have to just be at it as crazy. Yeah, like not as hard at that as I have to be, but then I can like breathe a little slow down and actually put out something like I'm very happy with and then you know like if you're waiting for like a sponsored ad and they're like oh yeah you know we'll review it and get back to you yeah <laughs> and you're like okay but like when <laughs> those are fun too I'm on those I'm on that hello fresh train yeah on for a minute yeah that's nice when you can get like the constant reoccurring ones that's our only one that they actually like agreed to a year long thing 
Oh, that's nice. So they're like, this is how much you're going to get. Got you for a year. So like those, yeah, it's like you, you, you they suck to do, but you got to do it if you want to elevate the business and just mm -hmm. keep everything flowing. It keeps just more stress off you knowing that you have those other sources of revenue coming in. We're in, we're in the worst avenue of YouTube. I was just going to say that. I've like, made that argument. I think it's the worst thing to be an automotive YouTuber. Yep. If you're trying to be a YouTuber, there are better avenues. The only, the not the only, but one of the plus sides I think to being an automotive YouTuber is if you grow your audience base, you always kind of have something to improve and move on to and get a new project. And you can always move on to a new car and you still stay a car person. Mm -hmm. But you see it with like gaming channels or people like if you, no matter who you are, if you can constantly innovate and stay trendy and like do cool things, you'll stay up there. But it does have the benefit, I think, to where once you build that audience, they'll watch you do whatever to where it's like if you're watching a game or something, someone doing something specific, if they go off what they are doing, then the viewership's going to drop. If they switch games, even yeah. they drop off kind of thing. Or if some guy has a lawn mowing comp, you know, channel, there's like, like reaction. And he channels. makes a video about doing something else in his daily mm -hmm. life. They're not going to watch it. Yeah. It's like they can only keep, and there's some people that kind of go on those trends just because they're chasing the views where at least in my case, I know I'm working on cars cause I like to do it and I got people watching me for what I like to do. So they'll probably just continue to do that hopefully for a really long period of time where you'll see big YouTubers come in and out just because what made them popular fades out and they, they try to adapt and do new stuff, but it's just people move on and new creators mm -hmm. take their place. Whereas I feel like there's still a lot of car guys that are still around, like even like Mighty yeah. Car Mods, like Plenty. they're still doing the same stuff. They're still successful. Like I think it kind of, I think it sticks a little better than some of the more trendy stuff you see out there. Yep. It definitely has more of a permanent place on YouTube. But then you look at somebody like unboxing stuff. That guy's got it figured out. Yeah. <laughs> You're just unboxing stuff every day. Yeah, but it's is that one of those things that goes that long for years know, to some come? Some of them do pretty well. Some of them go for a while. Yeah, but I mean, some of them do so good that they don't have to. <laughs> yeah, some of them have such a big explosion that they just like, because we're also talking about like a, you know, a minor percentage of people out there nowadays. Mm -hmm. but YouTube pays out, paid out so much money last year. I heard some statistics of like ad revenue and how much they've paid out is like just astronomical. Just imagine some of these people like making $60 million off of ad revenue. <laughs> it's crazy. But yeah, being back to the automotive stuff, like I think just what comes down to like how much time, money, and effort it takes to keep an automotive channel running if you don't have a good team around you, and especially if you're starting on your own, it's so tough because of like every check you get, you're just going to reinvest it into the car or project. And not only does it cost a lot, but you're one broken bolt away from your whole video not even being able to go up or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, other types of content, they just don't cost as much. They're more on the fly. You can make a video in 10, 20 minutes if you have the idea planned out. But, you know, the car has to be built. There's so much that goes into it. And that's automotive with us, like, building cars. Because then if you look at somebody like DeMiro, that's just like... Yeah, that's different. His are evergreen videos as well. And he has such low overhead on that deal. Yeah, he has a good setup too. To make those videos cost him next to nothing <laughs> and yeah, you just borrow a car you just use a car from someone and then you sell it on your own platform <laughs> that's where it really works out yeah the auction side of things yeah there's ways around everything but would you get into parts at all or would you just avoid that like selling parts because that's did, the other I thing my toe in the water but i ain't i ain't jumping in because that's the other thing of like I've heard a lot of people in the YouTube space talk about, they're like, as we're getting older, like, you know, do like a business, like something that's like not reliant on you making YouTube videos every day. And that's like, it's a scary one to think about. Like, oh, what do you have yeah, the, 10 years from now? The, the, 
the content creator being the main driving source of the business is scary. Like, have you seen the, the uh, it's just a picture of a pyramid. It's like business model and it's like CEO is at, at the top of the pyramid and all these little bits go down to like the, you know, the most basic employees. Mm-hmm. And that's how it, the triangle is. And if you take the CEO to, off the top, the triangle will still stand. Everything's still running, mm-hmm. you know, stuff's still getting shipped. But then from the YouTuber side, it's flipped you know, like this. Yeah. So this is the creator and he supports everything you take the creator out like something happens to mr beast or something like that whole business model everything is done yeah because without that human promoting it doing it if it's you know based around an individual like that especially when there's like you know and, 40 50 employees we're talking about at that point and like yeah that could don't that could like you know not really be like a scary world but you know if you're joining a content creator organization and they drop out you're out the job because you know they can't sustain it yeah and like one time like like a creator can get to a point where they're just like oh you know i'm, yeah, or they just, they just I'm done quit. like uh, i'm tapped out like you know because it is like something we think about like oh what are we going to be 50 years old making these same 60 years old making these same youtube videos I mean, I'll be 60 years old mobbing my Civic if I'm still around. I, I mean, figure. mobbing the Civic, yeah, but like... I'm going to have to figure out how to put self-driving on it, You're going to be vlogging? <laughs> I'm, I'll probably vlog. Yeah, I don't know. It gets like... It, I don't think I'd be... Yeah, it definitely would not be like daily They would be vlogging, changing, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd, content would change. I'd probably give an update here and there. <laughs> yeah, you'd be one of the... I mean, I guess if we're into a world where there's going to be less and less car enthusiasts, we're going to have a easier pool of, you know maybe other avenues of YouTube are blowing up. And if we're not, like if there's not new blood getting pushed into automotive YouTube constantly, we might be in a safe spot. Yeah. Because some, you know, gaming channels, there's probably 50 new ones of those started every five minutes. Oh, yeah. But automotive, it takes a lot of like ability and upfront, Mm -hmm. like upfront capital to get into it. To start making automotive content is... A, not a cheap one. Not at all. Because you probably couldn't get started the same way you did now, I feel like. And like all of us. Like, I don't think so, no. We got kind of lucky in a way. It's time and, and place. It, at that time, I thought we started late. And looking now, I'm like, we really didn't start that late. It's funny. Everybody, I feel like, thinks that. Everybody, everybody thinks, thinks that. That they started late. Everyone's like, I wish I started sooner. I feel like even like people like Roman Atwood think that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he's like an OG. <laughs> yeah, it was like one of the first. But yeah, like I you say starting just, now, like where like you think people would tune in the same way for a dude bol- bolting a single turbo onto a Civic? Like I don't know. I, I, just, I honestly don't know. I don't know if it's I don't know if people are drawn to the person specifically or for what they do or a combo of both or I, was, I don't know if you took a big automotive YouTuber now and just they had to restart and nobody knew him. I I don't think that I think it would be a lot tougher. Yeah, I think it's a really competitive pool now. I think that goes with any YouTuber, no matter yeah. what industry they're doing. If you took away their following and erased them from everyone's minds and they tried to restart, they aren't going to have the same explosions as they did. Yeah, it's all about the luck, the time, it, and the yeah, place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the luck. It's the it's like the timing of when you do things or what's trending at that time, mm-hmm. and you happen to come up with a good idea for that trend in that moment in time. And having like just the right budget and ability to make something thrown together because we all started with like some really cheap shit thrown together I still and then you build up thrown together i mean now it's built up <laughs> a lot more but yeah i mean definitely started out like really cheap shit thrown together extremely budget <laughs> <laughs> and now it's way different yeah because like getting started now like i t- somebody was talking to me about it and i was like i think you would just have to start on like shorts and like tiktok and then like try to like transfer an audience over yeah that would be like your only real avenue for doing that i don't know that's a tough one do you think uh do you think racing will get more popular as less people drive cars or do you think it would fade out i think because i think like is it true that more eyes are turning to like f1 like they're seeing the biggest amounts of live stream viewings and biggest turnouts I don't know if that's true, but yeah, I, F1 is blowing up. They just like did F1's a show. Blowing up. Like they I just did, did a TV show on Netflix that really blew them up. Because I just all the F1 drivers are becoming superstars. They're like bigger than 
like sports entertain like bigger than NFL players as far as following some of them at least. But yeah, well, I mean, Lewis Hamilton's been making like fifty million a year for the last like five years. Like he's been yeah, so like he's always been a top tier athlete. It's one of those things to where I wonder if like you watch a professional football player play because it's entertaining. You have a home team, and you also watch because they're a pro at what they do, and you probably won't be able to do that based on your physique or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if, like, that – and, like, even us, we would watch NASCAR F1 knowing, like, we can never be those guys because we don't have the budget or the team yep. or we weren't born into that. Super unattainable. But I don't know if us already being in motorsports, kind of getting into it now, where the next generation it might be harder because they might just not understand it as much. It might just be more – they just don't relate to it as well. But when they watch us do it, it might build a bigger audience because, like, if they're growing up with self-driving cars, they almost think it's more barbaric and crazy that people are, like, putting themselves in these 200-mile-an-hour rockets. And, like, I don't know if that could turn into, like, a bigger driving force to help bring more eyes to, like, even, like, the drag racing side of things or whatever it may be, or it might just continue to blow up NASCAR and F1 racing to where it's, like, it's not... It's no longer common for people mm-hmm. to drive cars. Like, oh, that's weird. They're in their drive. Like, these people are putting their lives at risk. Yeah. Because they're used to self-driving, perfect, non-crashing cars. I think like 20 years from now. Formula D is a really good example of that, though. Yeah, isn't that growing pretty big, too? Yeah, but no? they've been, like, I, 10 years ago, I was told it's the fastest growing form of motorsports. Faster growing than NASCAR. The 10 F- years ago. FD stuff. And it's still nowhere near the size I feel like it deserves to be for, like, the structure that they have and, like, the teams and, like, the... Like, it's still just, like, a live feed on Facebook that has 10,000 people watching. Like, it's still so far off from anything like like NASCAR or Formula One that, like, I, I don't know if it was bad decision-making on, like, their part. They like, didn't, didn't do the right things to climb to where, like, they're... Like, they almost should be, like, you think about, like, motorsports, and that's what you think about. Like, you think, like, NHRA top fuel, but, like, I don't know. Like, they just don't seem to have made it past, like, some wall threshold that they have. And I don't know what that is the cause of. And I worry that we might just be in the same deal where we just, like, can't get past this, like, barrier where we become more mainstream. I don't know. Some drag racers may say, well, I don't care to be mainstream. I don't want to be mainstream. But if we were more mainstream, we would bring a lot of more money into the sport, which would be better for everyone. If you can bring big title sponsors into sports, that's where everybody starts making really good money, and that's where you bring in a lot of, like, that's like opening the floodgates, you know? Yeah, but I feel like there's a big industry behind it with all the potential sponsors that could be out there. Just like how the, it's just, I mean, wherever you get the eyes, you're going to get the sponsors, no matter what brands, even if it's not car related, you're going to get them. But I've said many times I'll wrap my car M&Ms right now. Yeah. (laughs) If they're interested. That'd be pretty cool. (laughs) The M&Ms Camaro going down (laughs) the track. (laughs) But there's no big title sponsors like that in our levels of racing. Yeah, we just, if there's a way to figure that out, I mean, I don't know the last, I don't know the last time Gainesville has sold out, but it did recently. Yeah. Like, I don't know if that's a, I would assume that's a good sign. Like, I, they had the Gator Nationals there, and you saw, did you see the aerial yeah, photos? Yeah, I saw that. Sold out. Like, I don't know prior to that, when was the last time they did that? I would love to know, not trying to knock it, but I would love to know the average age of the people in the stands. Because I feel like that's also a predictor of the future if the average age of you know like nine out of ten people that walked in that door are over 60 that tells you a lot about what is going to happen in the next 20 years Yeah, hopefully there's a lot of kids that's what i mean like is there 20 year olds hopefully it's a lot of families with their kids that want to keep coming back yeah because that's that's an important thing that's that's kind of one of those like excitement factors like you go watch like like, that could be a big thing, just bringing the kids to it, because, like, you go watch Monster Jam or dirt bikes, even if they're doing stunts. Like, there's all kinds of, you know, events for that. But at some point, you know, when all the cars are electric and safe, if that's the route the world goes, then, like, drag cars, they're going to be just exciting and 
just kind of crazy, the smells, the right. sounds. That might be something that hopefully families would like to come see for big events and it can well, turn into something. With motorcycles is interesting because when you were growing up, I'm sure the X Games was something. But is it anymore? It's not that great anymore, no. But, like, that was something where you were like, oh, wow, this is going to be, like, the Olympics for freaking cool, like, cool sports that aren't mainstream enough for the Olympics. Skateboarding and BMX and, like, scooter and some, like, more, more like, dirt and off-road and stuff like that. And I feel like the X Games just, like, lost something that they had going. I feel the same because you don't you don't really hear about the X Games are coming up and and I'm really into all that like the the mm-hmm. BMX riders nowadays and like all these people are getting so good but I I mean I was really into watching all that stuff when I was young so maybe the demographic has always been smaller but I I feel like they've lost a lot of the audience they used to have yeah like I used I used I would think skateboarding I would say skateboarding lost a lot of traction over the years compared to back in like Tony Hawk's day and like all that when you see the massive crowds, you know, getting up by the half pipes and seeing all that. And I could be like ignorant on that. I don't know if it's still happening. I don't think it is. But I don't, I feel like I'd be at least seeing a clip every now and then. Yeah. You know, just to refresh my memory, even if I'm not too informed about it. And I feel like we like our mutual friends with basically all of the guys that were cool when the, the X Games were big yeah. at like, you know, like 2000, probably six, seven-ish was when they were like really popping off with like Pastrana and Renner and like those kind of guys and like um, Deegan, like right? Weren't mm-hmm. those guys like the ones that were like doing the cool stuff? And now those are still the biggest names of that came from the X Games from what I, from what my ignorant mind yeah, I, of I, don't extreme know they, I don't know if they've pushed it to a point to where all the craziest stuff has been done to where it's like you're I mean you can put your own style into something you can add a little spin here and there but but you're essentially at the limits of what can be done unless you add a bigger ramp and then at that point it's just a safety hazard if something goes yeah. wrong you die so yep. we're like at the limits of what's safe and in that amount of time you have in the air all the combinations of what you can flip, come off the bike, what direct, like it's all been done almost. There's still new stuff coming out, but I think back then it was so much more exciting because, you know, I don't know how far you have to go. It ain't too far back to where no one's doing a backflip on a dirt bike. Mm-hmm. So to see someone go upside down, you're like, holy crap, they're crazy. Yeah. And then they add to that, they add to that. So it's just this momentum growing. And now it's like everything's kind of been done. Well, Tony Hawk did like a 900 and then suddenly everybody started doing them. Yeah. Like, he kind of just, like, did it, and then it was proven that it can be done. And once you, like, prove something can be done, like, when we're, like, street, streetcar class is a great one. When somebody went sixes, suddenly it was proven a streetcar goes sixes, and it was, like, all of these cars started to do it. Like, full, true streetcars. <laughs> yeah. It always, it's crazy. Like, you'll see one person break through, and then... Mm-hmm everyone else follows but it always takes somebody like push that limit Mm -hmm. and i think there's something about seeing somebody else accomplish something just knowing like oh he did it so i know i can do it too and the first one through usually gets bloody yeah (laughs) that's kind of how it works or or they go down as like well like it's just like the first one through the door gets bloody and like you know they break all the parts they had to spend all the money to do it and like figure it out and then the guy behind them just kind of like strolls on through yeah. They didn't have to like, they didn't have to like push a boulder up a hill to figure it out. And then you just yeah. kind of follow in their trail that they made. Yeah. At least usually the people that get the credit are the ones that did all that work and yeah. pushed through and they paved the way for the next. That's why Tom Bailey gets all the credit he deserves. I mean, he's like one of the guys when you think yeah, about Yeah, he's one of the ones that pushed through. So, yeah, that's like one of the things that you think about. I don't know. I'm worried that drag racing could become like X Games where it's like, <laughs> Oh, no, I, I remember when that was really popping. <laughs> but it happens with classes in drag racing. Like, I mean, there is there is going to be a... Because we're kind of at that same spot in drag racing, too, where, like, get the limits of what you can do. We need a Vince I, mean, I know McMahon. you and Spencer were talking about going backwards in time, but <laughs> I don't think we're going to get that fast. 
Not in my lifetime. We need a Vince McMahon of drag racing, like WWE. That's what Vince McMahon did the WWE and made it what it is today and all the characters and, like, choreographed. Yeah, storylines, someone smashing windows out. Exactly. Like, something something to make it exciting. Exactly. Someone I think rip, that's what people someone like. Someone slashing the tires and the car still makes a pat. But, it, but with, with the cars, it's so much more unpredictable. If, like, you have a storyline to follow mm-hmm. and you need this car to win and it blows oh, yeah. up, storyline's over. Well, it's, like, the, the Christmas tree race is a good example of, like, I don't think the racing is all that important to people. Yeah. They come because they want to see some cars with Christmas trees looking ridiculous going down the track. Yeah, no, that's a good one. I don't think anybody cared who and, won. And it's almost like even with just YouTubers that, like, line up. Some people, they don't really care if the car is outclassing the other car. They just want to see the two line mm-hmm. up. They don't care if it's a, like, you know, we were talking about racing a top fuel car with our minivan. Like, we're obviously outgunned, but people like to see just, like, random random stuff. Yeah, just so like, like if me and you lined up, people would want to see that, even if... I mean, our cars are close. They are close right now. <laughs> our so. cars are really close. You've been faster than me, but my car is probably more likely... To go fast, I feel like it's it's we'll a lot to line them up. Yeah, and see. <laughs> like I just feel like um, because the stick shift just adds that massive variable, <laughs> just it, sequential. If it has a clutch, it adds a huge variable, and anybody clutch racing is wild. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what the auto life's about. It's great life. Um, somebody commented, "What's your most difficult build?" My most difficult. Yeah, what's well, been your most difficult build? It's been the one that you really pull the hair out on, bring the grays in. I mean, probably the MR2. Yeah. I'd have to say, yeah. I mean, I don't know if difficult is the word, but it's definitely the most time involved. Definitely has gotten the most of my money, <laughs> and just the most effort has gone into that difficult. one. Yeah, financially, <laughs> mentally. Yeah. Yeah, I put a lot, of, a lot of effort into that one. I feel like it's broken on you at some tough times, too. Yeah, here and there. Like sometimes I was like, why now? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the last time it broke was pretty shitty, but in indie, right? Yeah. But at that point stuff happens and that it had already done what I wanted it to do. So right now if something happens to it, I don't get mad at it anymore. Yeah. But when I was like on my way to like trying to run a number or something and stuff would break, I'd I get pissed. Do you think with what you learned on that car is going to hugely accelerate the NSX like five steps? 10 steps forward from what you had to I think it'll the give it trial a, and error. I, yeah, I think it'll give it a big jump. I think the biggest thing is just knowing how to drive like that mid-engine car like that Yeah, and just knowing where to get the weight. I think it's definitely going to go fast right away. Are, say. are you most excited for that one then? Or the Civic? That's a tough one. It's tough. Those the two Civics. are cool. And what we're doing with the, the Plaid too, I'm really excited for. Oh, yeah. I don't want to give away too many. Do you? I think you know already. Though. I do know it. Yeah. Yeah. We're that pretty one far it, in, so. I'm excited for that one. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a really cool build. Well, I won't take any more of your time. We'll do this again, though. But thank you so much for coming on, man. Find him at Boosted Boys on all social media platforms. But that's going to do it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for coming on, Kyle. That was fun, man. Yeah, but, glad I could be here. Yeah, we'll end it off there.